Hello and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Pick a Side podcast. My name is Joel Moran and I'm here with River Brown, Andrew Velez, and John Carlos. And this is now episode 152. In this episode, we are going to be joined by a New York Times bestselling author, Chris Herring, to talk about his new book, Blood in the Garden, the flagrant history of the 1990s New York Knicks. After having him on, we'll discuss the James Harden dilemma, react to the All-Star Reserves, our top point guards, Clippers' recent trade with the Blazers, and more. A quick Patreon shout out to Tyler, Ruthless Rooster, Sensei Stevie, Drew Stop Whining, SA Crimes, <laughs> Kevin, Woody Buckets, Tizzy, Corey, Max, Dylan, Playboy, Orlando, Chris, Charles, Michael, Greg, Cole, On Bloods, Ka, Liam, T Grove, B Money, Ryan, Epic Lankiness, Travis Ball, Aaron Moran, Matthew Jimenez, It's Black Ace, Anthony, BJ, PJs, Langston, Jazzy Juice, Johannes, Ruben, Ricky, Enzo, Sean, Muffins, John, Sean Triplett, Court Cousins, Ben Mack, P. Dot, George Hikari, Mateen, Dave Two Freedom, and Jay Aqua. Good old Jay Aqua. Let's at, get into it. At y'all. some point. No, we're not. No, we're at not. some point we're not. we can't name every single. <laughs> no, we can. Name. We can and we will. We can and we will. We don't. He do. So. God bless him. God bless him. That's why I had to take a big sip of water. I had to prepare my voice. It's the intro. It's come on. It's like two plus minutes of talking. <laughs> it's become routine at this point, though. We got to do it. And Charles told me that he wants to be called Big Chuck now. I don't even. Is Charles on? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's Charles. Big yeah. Chuck. Yeah. Okay. All right. Big Chuck. He got to change his Patreon name to Big Chuck. I think you know? it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, oh, it I is. haven't checked. Uh-huh. I just checked like the new ones. Uh huh. But right now we're joined with uh, uh, Chris Herring. Yes, you just sir. dropped a new book. We have it right here, Blood in the Garden. I, I started reading it a bit. I'm on uh, page 50. I'm on chapter five right now. And, and it's a really good read. I'm actually a Knicks fan. I have this foam finger right behind me. And it, it's good to learn about the best era of, of Knicks basketball, at least in the last 30 years, because we know since th- this era, the Knicks have been bad. Yeah, uh, that, that's that part, I think, goes without saying, that they, you know, or or even when they're, you know, they're, I don't know if they're bad now. I, obviously, they're they're not good. You know, they're out of the playoff race or out of the playoff seating for right now. But the way I've said it for a while now on these rounds that I've been making, they haven't been consistently good since those years. And I don't even think they were consistently good. I think they're kind of on the cusp of being consistently great. You know, I think they were the third best team in that era. As far as wins and losses, they went to two finals. They could have gone to more had it not been for Michael Jordan. They almost beat Michael Jordan a couple of times. Um, you know, and I would go out as far to say during the, the years that Michael actually made it to the finals and won the championships, I think the Knicks were the toughest team for him to get through during those years. Uh, you know, the Pistons obviously beat Michael twice, but once Michael became a champion, I don't know that there was a team that was tougher for him to get through, get around a team that he feared more, if you could really say he feared. But, you know, if you read far en- enough into the book, and I think you have, there was a time where he really made it clear that, like, it, th- that he really had to think twice about whether he wanted to do certain things on the court because of this team. And I think that's kind of the, 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 if, if you would say the legacy of that team is that I think that their physicality was something that the league didn't want anything to do with. And I think that, um, part of the reason you see today is wide open game now is because of that Knicks team and the fact that the league basically said never again when it came to having a team like that that was going out in some cases trying to hurt people in some cases doing that because Pat Riley had essentially ordered them to um so yeah there was something that they stood for at that time that isn't really allowed by the NBA now but um yeah it was the last time that they were a consistent winner and there were a lot of crazy personalities on that team and um you know, I, it, it makes me happy to know that younger people kind of get a chance to read up on those teams they didn't know as much about. Uh, but even for people that that were around or did understand it, you know, I think it's good for them to know what happened behind the scenes because, um, you know, it was never fully out there. There was no social media back then. And, this, um, you know, hopefully I'm presenting a lot of new stuff that's never been out there. This book, Blood in the Garden, made the New York Times bestsellers list. And first of all, congratulations on that accomplishment. No doubt. No doubt. This is, I believe, from the research I've done, this is your first book that made the New York times bestseller list. Just how does that feel making it 
to that remarkable milestone. I mean, it, it must be awesome. This is my first book, period. Wow. Um, so it's, I mean, it's uh, overwhelming to one think for one. about. One for one. <laughs> right, right, right. It's it's overwhelming. I mean, you know, obviously when you work on something for a while, you hope that it's received well. You hope it gets good reviews. You hope a lot of people read it. You know, I, I'll admit that I hoped at a certain point that it would make the list. Um, I never dreamed that it would make the list and then make the list a second time the next week, which is very difficult because you, you pull so much into trying to make the list once it, it made it twice. I think a lot of that has been word of mouth. Um, and on top of that, you know, it's getting a ton of attention. Spike Lee posted it on his Instagram. Um, a lot of people are reaching out about the idea of trying to get the film rights for it so that it can be made in a documentary. Um, That's sick. You know, I, I never imagined any of this this stuff. I mean, like, like I said, maybe you hope it makes the list for a week, but it's kind of taken on a life of its own. I'm just extremely, extremely grateful and um, humbled. And mostly, like I said, I've been kind of emotionally overwhelmed by it just because it, um, you know, if you guys follow me or follow my work at all. I've been trying to retweet as many people as I can who've, you know, been posting their pictures of the book or have said that they've been reading it and, you know, their, their pictures of it. And I reached a point, you know, during that first week that it came out that I just stopped because I was like, this is getting to the point where it's kind of obnoxious, where <laughs> I can't physically, I, I guess physically I could, but like, I, I can't retweet the 800 people that have posted this book today. It's, it's probably doing too much. Um, but to see something about seeing all that support all at the same time, all at once, um, and just kind of asking like, why, how, or why was, did I ever get to a point where I would be that fortunate that 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 many people would want to go support him. Maybe it was just that I hit a subject that's really near and dear to the hearts of Knicks fans. But um, even with that in mind, I mean, there've been other books written about the Knicks that, that weren't bestsellers um, about championship teams, you know, that weren't bestsellers, Knicks championships that weren't bestsellers. So I'm just, I just feel really, really fortunate and really, really grateful that so many people would buy the book and make a point to tell other people about the book, to buy multiple copies of it for people in Australia to say, man, I've been trying to wait and trying to wait. Um, but because I, you know, I had to listen to it or hear it or read it. So I got the Kindle, but now I'm getting the hardcover because I want one on my shelf and I'm getting the audio book to support you even further. Like people are just kind of wilding as far as like how much <laughs> support they're showing, which is really beautiful and in, in the most pure way. And I'm just super appreciative for it. I will say the hardcover of the book f feels amazing. It, I don't know how to describe it, just the texture of it. It has these letters that stick out in orange the paper material, it just feels awesome. Like, it just feels awesome. When I first got this book, I was very excited. I think the most interesting thing about you writing this book is that you're not a Knicks fan. You know, you grew up a Chicago Bulls fan. And I think because you're not a Knicks fan, it allows you to take out a lot of bias when you wrote this book. One of the more interesting scenarios that I found when I was reading the book is about Patrick Ewing. Before Pat Riley got there... Um, there was this clause in his contract that if he wasn't a top five highest paid player in the NBA, he could become a free agent. And he was thinking about joining Golden State when they had Chris Mullen, Tim Hardaway and Mitch Richmond. And in my head, I'm just like, in hindsight, he probably should have made that move. I, I feel like that's a <laughs> champ. That's a championship team. Uh, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, well, the first thing I think about it, it's like, wow, stuff was different in the NBA back then as far as the way contracts could be drawn up and the freedom of movement that, that players had. Um, you're right. He had a clause in his deal that if he was not in the top four, actually, of the highest paid salaries, because when he get, came in the league, he had the highest salary as a rookie. He had the most expensive deal in NBA history in 85. Um, but, you know, his agent was the same guy that represented Michael Jordan and David Falk. And had a contract where if he fell outside the top four, that it gave him the ability to immediately become a free agent. And, you know, so at a minimum, he can make more money. But also, if he wants to leave and go to a different team, it gives him that freedom. So that was why he wanted to exercise that clause, because by 91, at the start of starting place of the book, when they're getting Pat Riley, the Knicks kind of had sucked by that point. Um, Patrick had had, I think, five or six general managers in the six years he'd been there. He'd been an all star five times. Um, he'd had three or four, um, I'm sorry, he had five or six coaches and, and three or four general managers in that time. Wow. And, you know, it was pretty much like a, it's probably putting it a little bit too bluntly, but 
like an orphan that just doesn't get a chance to kind of get comfortable in a home uh, because stuff keeps getting moved around and shifted around and doesn't really have a trust that the Knicks are going to be able to figure it out and build a sustainable winner around a, a franchise cornerstone and a guy that really, you know, to a lot of people had been the biggest college name to come out of college in a couple of decades uh, since Lou Alcindor. So I think all those things uh, kind of point to why Patrick wanted out. Um, but when it came down to it, the way that David Falk was trying to label the the different deals that were out there, I think, you know, Larry Bird, Michael Jordan, Hot Rod Williams were like the top three paid guys. Patrick was fourth, but he couldn't, David Falk couldn't <laughs> legitimately find a guy that made more than Patrick did through salary. So he was looking at like signing bonuses and all these other things to loop in other people's deals to try to make an argument that, okay, um, well, Chris Mullen is the fifth highest paid guy for right now, but if they give him some of his money from the back end of his deal and make it do this year instead, he'll technically make more than Patrick does this year. So that was kind of what happened is that David Falk was trying to get the Warriors to manipulate Chris Mullen's salary so that they could make him the fourth highest paid guy, move Patrick out of the top four, make Patrick a free agent, but then just sign Patrick once he became a free agent. Mm. So it's kind of a, a way that, again, stuff was different back then, but also Chris Mullen's agent was also Charles Oakley's agent. Charles Oakley didn't want to be on an Island in New York by himself. So his agent spoke up basically to make sure that the Knicks were aware of what was happening so that they wouldn't lose Patrick. Uh, so anyway, a, a court ruled that Patrick did not have the right to become a free agent based on some of the manipulations that were happening that way. So it put him in a position where he couldn't just, he wanted to demand a trade, but then when they hired Pat Riley, Pat Riley kind of talked him off a ledge a little bit and uh, obviously made a big difference because had they lost Patrick, um, you know, I think it probably is a lot longer before the team is relevant. No doubt. Uh, they would have been without a star. They would have had a lot of, I'm sure nice players, but um, you know, at a certain point you at least need a star to try to go toe to toe with the team like Chicago, or to, at least to try to, they obviously didn't beat Jordan during that era, but, I don't think they would have had any shot without somebody like Patrick, who was really, really, really good. Um, maybe not good enough to win a title by himself, but um, was really good considering how little offense they had for that team. Yeah. Uh, one of the funny stories in the book that I found was about Greg Anthony and about his jump shot and how these coaches would make bets about how many he'd basically brick and they have they'd have contests about this and also what i've learned so far in the book is about pat riley and basically his come up you wrote a chapter about him his char charisma he exuded as a coach the demands he basically made the knicks like if you guys want me as a coach this is what i'm demanding this and that and it was surprising to me that the knicks well he denied a marketing ad that had his left hand with championship fingers on it and his right hand was going to show that this this is reserved for the Knicks and he denied that marketing campaign. I feel like for the type of person he was, I, I was kind of surprised to see him deny it. But why do you think that was? Well, I don't think he's outwardly showy as far. I mean, he is, first of all, as far as like the Armani suits and stuff. But as far as the way he wants certain things to come off. So what you're talking about in particular, the Knicks weren't a good team when Pat Riley got there. They had won 39 games the year before that. Um, so the only thing they have to market, Patrick had been there for six years. So whatever fans you're drawing because of Patrick, you've already gotten. Uh, but, you know, you're not winning with Patrick necessarily. So the new thing they have to market around is Pat Riley. And when he got there, like you said, he, they had an advertising campaign with the poster. They wanted to build an advertising campaign around him with his left hand showing the five rings he'd won with LA four as a coach and one as a player. Um, but then with the other hand naked, and then the ad would say he's saving this hand for New York. It's a brilliant idea, That's fire. but Pat Riley basically said, you're not going to make this about me. This is about the team. I want us to be team focused. This is not about me. And I don't really want it to be about Patrick or anyone else either. I want it to be focused on the team. So that was why he said that was that he didn't want it to be singular. Um, Pat did plenty on his own from a singular standpoint, obviously he left the Knicks for a massive contract that was kind of unheard of with Miami that had an ownership stake attached to it, even though he was under contract with the Knicks when he did it. 
Um, so he did plenty that was about him. He did twenty thousand dollar talks, um, you know, in front of corporations and stuff like that. Which twenty thousand dollars back then, I can't even imagine exactly how much money that is now. But it, it was a lot of money in nineteen ninety one, ninety two, ninety three. So uh, Pat did plenty for himself, but I think he at least wanted to make it about the team as far as the public messaging was concerned. But but make no mistake, I mean, he was a guy that worked these guys to the bone. Um, who got them to buy into a common goal, which was to win a championship, despite the fact that they really didn't have the most talent in the league. Um, I'm not even sure they had the second most talent in the league. They were skilled on defense. But they were not very skilled on offense. You're mentioning that, you know, the team's coaches played rock, paper, scissors to determine who would rebound for Greg Anthony in practice because he was a bricklayer, um, you know, and they had a lot of guys on that team that were not very skilled offensively outside of Patrick. Um so Pat Riley basically looked at what they were and he said, you know, you guys are not my showtime teams from the Lakers. Um, we're pretty offensively challenged. And so the best shot we have of winning is trying to have a team that basically takes the Pistons bad boys defensive strategy and Jordan rules defensive strategy and try to use it ourselves because we're younger than they are. Uh, we have big bodies. We have physical guys that can make life difficult for him and other teams. And we basically can intimidate the hell out of our opponents. And that's our best shot of winning is that we don't have enough offense, but we have defense and you guys will get in good shape and I'll have you guys foul a ton in the early stages of games. It would be like if you had a team that was just realized, okay, we're just going to hack you on every play and interfere with your receivers. Every time you go down the field, we're going to get some pass interference penalties, but they can't call that all game. That's essentially what the Knicks were doing. They knew that they couldn't whistle it all game. They, they hacked the crap out of you. Their games were longer than any other teams on average uh, because they were hacking teams constantly. They fouled more than any team during that era, but they also were going to punish you if you came down the lane and tried to score on a layup, but they weren't going to let you have anything easy. If they did knock you down, they weren't going to help you up. There was an intimidation factor, and Riley wanted it that way. Riley showed them videos of Rams headbutting each other in car crashes before games and then would walk out of the locker room without sure. saying a word to them. He would slide into the locker room wearing baseball spikes and then tell his players, you know, whenever you do something defensively, make sure to do it with your spikes high, basically meaning if you happen to take someone out and playing that physically aggressively, so be it. Like, don't worry about the outcome. Just go in there with your spikes up. Like that's wild messaging <laughs> oh, <for that>. sure. <laughs> would not exist in today's NBA, but it was just a different time. The guy, ducked his head in an ice cooler before a game for two and a half, three minutes. Then his assistant coach pulled him out. Riley takes a massive gasp for air once he comes out. And then after he composes himself, he's like, that's how bad you should want to win. As bad as I needed that breath. Like, that's not normal. And uh, <laughs> yes. Pat Riley was not a normal dude. I don't know that he's a normal dude now. I mean, he'll be 77 next month. But, um, but I think he knew that. And I think it was just, it was a messaging thing. I think the challenge is when you get as close as the Knicks got during those years, as many times as they got close, at a certain point, if you don't win the whole thing, I think that stuff starts to wear thin a little bit. And I, I also think it, it starts to kind of wear thin on Pat Riley, too, because you're you're pushing your foot on the pedal so aggressively, so hard that at a certain point, it's like it it, it gets to be a bit challenging to come up with new concepts and new things to talk about with your players. Um, when you get that close and don't quite get there. You mentioned the the Pistons a little bit earlier, and you mentioned how the league wanted to make sure that nothing that the Knicks had done could be seen again. What is, in your opinion, what is the difference between what the Knicks were doing and what the Pistons were doing? And do you believe that the NBA should have changed the rules after the bad boy Pistons? I think there's two things. Um, one, the Pistons had a lot more offense than the Knicks did. I mean, they had sure. a couple of Hall of Famers on that team. Definitely. The Knicks had just the one with Patrick. They had Joe Dumars. They had, um, obviously, Isaiah, Isaiah Thomas, yep, who yep. Dennis by himself. You know, so they had a lot of wing talent that the Knicks just didn't have. You know, and even even uh, John Starks, you know, was a one-time All-Star. Charles Oakley was a one-time All-Star. Anthony Mason was a one-time All-Star, and that All-Star appearance was not even as a Nick. Um, the Pistons just had a, a bunch of guys, you know, even off their bench that were just, they had uh, Vinny Johnson, you know, his nickname was the microwave. So they had guys off the bench that could score a lot too. Um, the Knicks were just a, a, a really stout defensive team that 
finished number two in the league in defensive efficiency in Riley's first year, and then finished number one the three years after that. They were very skilled on defense. I don't think they get quite enough credit for that, but yeah. they were trying to win games through defense and really didn't have much offense to speak of. John Starks was an incredibly flawed offensive player. He was a good player, but he was an incredibly flawed one that I think he was kind of beloved because people realized what his shortcomings were um, and still fought hard and still almost won a championship despite them. He was a guy that was undrafted, um, you know, who had really bad hot or cold streaks, uh, hot and cold streaks. So that that's one difference. I think the other difference is it's a lot harder to change the rules in the midst of a team having a championship run. Yeah. Which the Pistons won back to back titles. Uh, how do you say with a straight face, okay, we're going to change these rules, which might disadvantage our reigning champion, our two time reigning champion? Yeah. You can't really do that. The, the Knicks didn't win. So I think, as inconvenient as it was for them, it's a lot easier to say, we're going to change these rules because the league <laughs> is getting really sloppy and really nasty. Yeah. Um, and two, they were also looking to change the rules, I think, because the scoring was down. After Michael Jordan left, they were trying to keep people engaged and ratings were falling. And so they were trying to find ways to, to increase the scoring, which meant that they were going to um, try to do things to de-emphasize the physicality. So um, I think that was the big difference is like if the Knicks had won a championship, then maybe the league is a little bit slower yeah. about changing some of that. But, you know, the league made it really clear we didn't want physicality to become more important than skill and talent and athleticism. And, you know, at that point, the Knicks already had teams that were trying to kind of copy what they were doing. The Pacers are a really good example of that. No where doubt. Donnie Walsh, their GM from those years, told me, called me and uh, said, you know, there was one play in particular where Oakley just fouled Reggie so hard or knocked Reggie down so hard and threw his shoulder at Reggie as he came down the lane. And the refs watched it happen but didn't call a foul. And the ball bounced off Reggie's hand. He was trying to back cut into the lane. Oakley saw him and threw his shoulder out and the ball clearly went off Reggie's hand, but the refs didn't call it the right way. Even though everybody in the arena saw it went off Reggie's hand, they gave the ball to the, to the Pacers. So they made up for it. And either a makeup or what Donnie Walsh says, like, I think they were so legitimately confused by <laughs> what just happened that like he, Donnie Walsh said to himself, I, I kind of want two guys like that on my team come next year because it, it, this is so rough and tough and physical that the refs don't even know what to call. And again, I, I think that was part of what the Knicks were doing on purpose is by hacking so much at the beginning of games, make it so that refs have to make a decision about what they're actually going to call a foul because they can't keep stopping the game. So, I mean, it, it was already influencing the Pacers who went from a an up and down run and gun team to a, a mostly a defensive juggernaut that was going to have guys that would all use up all six of their fouls. Um, the league didn't want that. And, uh, and I mean, as you see now in today's game, I think the Knicks are partly to thank for that, you know, as far as seeing guys that pull up from 35 or 40 feet. Um, the league was starting to encourage some of that in the late 90s, but that was because of the Knicks mm -hmm. and the fact that they did not want teams to be playing in a shoebox, basically, um, but also did not want teams just hurting people and uh, knocking people down on purpose. So you, 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 you touched on it a little bit. Michael Jordan leaves and the Knicks – finally get to the finals can you just give a brief you know a description of like what was the atmosphere like for new york at that time you know getting to the finals making it there you know they've they've been a competitive team like you said michael jordan he stopped a couple guys from getting a ring but they finally get there and just what was the atmosphere like before when they got there and then after when they lost especially for patrick ewing because i know he gets lost in the conversation for one of the greatest bigs ever no doubt you no know, because he doesn't have the ring like hakeem or Dave Riley, he doesn't have all that, but can you just talk about like the atmosphere in New York at that time before and after they lost? Sure. So I, I, I have a chapter in the book called Daylight because Jordan kind of shat, overshadowed everything that everybody did during those years. There's a really good anecdote in the book about the fact that Pat Riley, after that game five loss, the Charles Smith game that, you know, Nick fans lives in infamy for them. <laughs> no um, doubt. Pat Riley goes to Hawaii um, that summer in 93 and um, rents out a presidential suite for his family and, um, you know, at a Hawaii resort. And in the middle of the trip, he gets asked to, they, they basically say, we have to move you out of the room. We're really sorry. Something really unexpected has come up. Riley's furious because he's obviously paid good money for a room. Um, 
And, you know, they accommodate him by saying, we'll, we'll, we'll move your bags and put you in the next nicest suite we have. We're really sorry about this. Maybe if you guys go swimming or go have breakfast or something like that, we'll, you know, we'll have you guys situated in your next room by the time you guys finish. So Riley goes down and, you know, his family's swimming. And he looks up at the suite multiple times, try to figure out, like, what the hell just forced me to move? And, you know, 15, 20 minutes go by. He looks up again. He finally sees the doors to his balcony swinging open from that presidential suite. And it's Michael Jordan standing there in a bathroom. And, you know, it was just a sign of the fact that, like, no matter where you went or what you did, Michael was always kind of hovering over every achievement or accomplishment you might potentially have. And I think that that was the way the whole league felt at that time. So, you know, they felt a sigh of relief a little bit, but they were already working hard. I think this was a hard working team all the time. They always worked hard even before they knew Michael had was going to step down and retire. Um, they had scheduled their training camp to start at 12 on one, the first allowable minute of that season, you know, instead of starting at 9 AM or 10 AM mm-hmm. the next day, they started at 12 on one uh, at midnight, basically because they wanted to be the first team on the court and the last one to leave at that season. So they were already doing that. And then two days later, Michael retired. Um, so they were working really hard. I mean, they were immediately one of the favorites. Uh, and even in 93, I think that they were kind of like essentially kind of co-favorites with the Bulls for sure, because they were a 61 team. They were a really good team that year. Um, really well coached. They had some talent. They had a lot of skill on the defense. They had Ewing. So they were, they were expected to really be a contender. They got all the way to the finals and you know, you brought up Hakeem and brought up David Robinson. Um, you know, I think it was tough for Patrick because he was a great player during that era. There's no question about that. I don't think he was as good as either of those two. And in particular, if you go back and look at the numbers and the tape of the 94 finals, Ewing did not fare very well against Hakeem Olajuwon. He broke a record, I think, for blocked shots in a series. So he, he did okay defensively, but Hakeem was outplaying him quite a bit. I think Patrick had either four or five games during that series in which he shot under 40%. Um, you know, he, he just was not a capable scorer in that series the way he was used to being. And because of it, John Starks, you know, kind of became their number one option. Again, a guy that I think on a true champion is probably ideally like your third or your fourth option. Um, maybe even like a sixth man for some teams. Uh, he was six, two, and they listed him at six, five, he's undersized. Um, and he was very hot and cold. So, you know, probably the quickest way to explain it. He was their number one option in that series because Patrick didn't have it. Um, he, his uncle had died right before the series, uh, super unexpectedly, an uncle that he was planning to have at the at the finals in Houston. And, you know, two days before his great uncle passes away, someone that was, you know, closer to being like a father figure to him because his dad was not in the picture. He shoots three for 18 in game one, but then he shoots really well in games two to six. And particularly in games four, five, and six, he had double digit fourth quarters. Um, he shot 50% from the field in games two to six, uh, 45% from three was averaging 21 a game, something like seven assists per game. He was killing it. And he was really the reason they had a chance to win the series. They went into game six up three to two. They went into the last game, the last play of game six down 86 to 84 with John Starks taking the last shot. And he gets a screen from Patrick. He's got a chance to win the game. Starks had made six shots in a row at that point. And he leaves his feet to take a three that if it goes down, the Knicks win the championship. And what ended up happening because Patrick screened for him, it brought Hakeem Olajuwon, the two-time defensive player of the year, reigning defensive player of the year, into the play um, where he switched and somehow covered a ton of ground just to get maybe a fingernail on John's shot that John to this day feels like would have gone in. And so he blocks the shot at the buzzer, comes up three or four feet short um, as an air ball, which was a block. And what ended up happening, and I have this in the book at length, uh, which had really never been out there, John essentially couldn't sleep for the next three nights because he was traumatized by the way the game ended. He's someone that normally could very easily just kind of flush a bad game or a bad play down the toilet. Um, he couldn't do it for some reason in this case. I guess they were in Houston for the next three nights. It used to be that series went 2-3-2, where the three middle games would be the lower-seeded team would have at home, and then the last two games would be at home for the the team to have home court advantage. So these last two games were in Houston. 
the Rockets are able to sleep in their own beds and kind of live their own lives for those last two games of the series because they're at home and they're comfortable and they're reveling in that game six win that they won in really thrilling fashion. The Knicks are just stuck on game six and can't really think of anything else. Can't watch TV in their hotel rooms because like all that they're showing in local television is the fact that the Rockets stayed alive and starts takes it harder than anyone. And he can't flush that game for some reason. So he hasn't been able to sleep. He comes back for game seven terrible game. and is terrible He's not really focused or locked in on defense because his mind is all over the place. He hasn't slept. And when it comes to the actual shooting, he starts one for 13. Riley stays with him, I think, for for no other reason, because he's basically been their savior the whole series. He's been the only guy that can consistently score, really him and Derek Harper. Um, But the thing that I bring up, which had really not been out there before this book came out, is that. Rolando Blackman, who was one of Starks' backups that did not play much that season, but was a guy that up until Dirk came along was the leading scorer in Dallas Mavericks franchise history, a four-time all-star, one of the better shooting guards from that era, um, and a guy that was on the Knicks bench. Pat Riley didn't ever sub him in, but a lot of the players wonder and were, were saying to me for the book, we all got the impression that Pat wasn't using Rolando because he and Rolando got into an argument before the final started. And when I asked what the argument was about, Rolando wanted the players to be able to bring their wives on the road to Houston for that series because it had been a really long season. The Knicks would set a record that year for the most postseason games played in one playoffs with 25. So they were like, it's been a really long season. None of us have ever won a championship before. Um, This is a crowning achievement for us as a team. Uh, We want to be able to bring our wives to celebrate it, to, you know, to have them share this with us, share this with us. And, uh, Pat Riley just said no. And then Rolando um, shot back and he was like, I'm not understanding why we shouldn't be able to do this. It's not going to be a distraction. These are our wives. These are not just random groupies or anything like that. Like we want to be able to bring them. It'll help calm us down. It'll help put us at ease at a time where it would probably help when we're really going to be high strong and really excited. And again, Pat said no. And he was kind of offended that Rolando would continue to press the question and ask in front of the team. And Pat was a very in or out sort of coach. I have one anecdote in the book about the fact that Pat got angry one time with the team president, Dave Checkets during those years, because he could overhear Dave Checkets having a conversation with Dave Checkets, wife about what color family car they were going to get. She wanted to get a, a suburban for the family. And she said, how would green be Dave? Is that okay? If I bring home a green suburban, Dave said, that's fine. Pat could overhear the cell phone conversation. He's like, Green, you you must be crazy. Like green doesn't work. That's the, the color the Celtics wear. And Riley had the big rivalry with the Celtics during the eighties. Check it starts laughing, but Riley is sitting there with a completely straight face. He's completely <laughs> serious. And so then Check it's his wife says, "Okay, then how about red?" And Riley gets even more angry about that because he's like, "That's like one of our current rivals, Dave. That's the Bulls. Can't get red." So they end up getting a blue suburban because Riley feels like it's a betrayal to have anything other than blue. So as silly as it sounds that Riley might have held Rolando Blackman out because he asked, could the players bring their wives on the trip? The players themselves still think in a lot of cases that that was why Riley might have held Rolando out of that series, despite the fact that Rolando over his career was a Rockets killer. And to, you know, to this day, now that he's retired, the highest scoring average of his career against any one team was against the Rockets. His best field goal percentage against any team was against the Rockets. I talked to Rockets players in this book that were petrified that Rolando Blackman was going to come off the bench and kill them the way he always had, but he never got a chance to because Pat didn't bring him in. And after that, you know, Pat has written what I think you could fairly construe as apology letters to Rolando Blackman over the years saying that it's the biggest mistake he's ever made as a coach to not put him in. And Rolando's never written back to the letter. So, you know, there's a lot to all that. When we talk about Jordan, we talk about Ewing as it relates to the other centers of the era. He also lost, you know, he didn't lose, but the Knicks lost to the Spurs years later. And David Robinson was another guy that I think you could say was probably slightly better than Ewing. Those might have been the two centers that for his whole era were a little bit better than he was, but it, it really showed in the Rocket series. And, um, you know, the Spurs it was even tougher because they didn't have Ewing. He wasn't healthy enough to play in the finals, but they also had Tim Duncan that year. So um, it was just an era where they didn't quite have enough. And I think 
you know, Pat Riley understandably has like a great reputation as a coach and one of the best coaches of all time. I think he did a hell of a job coaching the Knicks as well, but I do wonder whether he might've been able to pull a different lever there and make a different decision. Uh, You definitely have some players from that Knicks team that kind of feel like he shouldn't have handled that a little bit differently. Something that you say that I really agree with is that the most fascinating teams are at times the ones that don't win it. We know about the Bulls. We know about the Warriors in this era. But at, for me in this era, the 2018 Rockets are one, one of the most fascinating teams to ever make it, coming one game shy of <laughs> beating Golden State. <laughs> and I think that describes the Knicks in the 90s. Uh, something that's going on currently with the Knicks that I want to get your thoughts on, then uh, uh, you can head out, is how do you feel about the situation with Julius Randle currently, there's this growing debate on Twitter if whether or not Knicks fans are a bit too harsh. And we know if you look at the Knicks history, we didn't treat Patrick Ewing the best, He, even though he's one of the best Knicks of all time. Carmelo kind of got the cold shoulder on his way out from New York as well. Uh, do you think Randle is to blame in this situation because his play has dropped off or do you feel like fans are being a bit too harsh on him currently? Uh, I mean, I, I think, I think fans in the Northeast, I wouldn't even put it just on Knicks fans. I think Sixers fans are a good example too. They can be, they can be a little bit brutally honest sometimes when you're not playing well, a uh, little is probably putting it mildly sometimes. Um, but I, I think that they're going to be the first ones to respect you if you play well, which I don't know if you get credit for that. Um, just because I think most fan bases are going to support you if you play well. Um, and they can be very biting and kind of rude if, if you're not playing well. Um, I would suggest that fans remember that last year was a career year for him in a way that a lot of people started asking, like, is that sustainable? Probably wasn't fully sustainable. We saw it come apart in the playoffs. Um, but I also think that, like, I don't think anybody in their right mind thought Julius was like a lead number one guy that can lead you to a title or anything close to that. So what I would be interested to see if it happens at some point is whether Julius can be more of a second guy if they do get a Lillard or, you know, it looks like it won't be hardened, but like if they go out and get a Bradley Beal or someone else via trade or via free agency, to me, that's what I ask. People keep asking me, is Dolan the reason they're not good now? I mean, maybe, but they've had years here and there where they're good unexpectedly. I covered one when I covered the team for the Wall Street Journal in 2012. And they won 54 games out of nowhere uh, and were a number two seed out of nowhere. Like Jim Dolan was still there when that happened. Um, So I don't think you can completely ignore him when they play well, because he's still there and part of stuff. Um, I think what they've been missing for the last 20 years since Patrick left is a a bona fide star that you're not looking at him from year to year to figure out whether he's a star. He's just a star every year, like a top 10 player in the league every year. Um, And I think if you had somebody like that, it would kind of mitigate however bad the owner might be or how harmful the owner might be. Um, so Julius, I don't know. Like, and, and I think you bring up a good point too, that like I've got something in the second chapter, you know, on St. Patrick's day in 1987, because it was St. Patrick's day, they were handing out posters of, you know, seven foot long posters of Patrick Ewing with a tick mark for each inch of his height. And the Knicks were playing a really horrible Denver team that night. Um, and, you know, probably expecting to be competitive because the Knicks were bad too. So at least they have a shot because they're playing another bad team. But the Nuggets went up by 27 at the Garden, and fans started getting fed up, and Patrick wasn't playing well that night, neither was anybody else. And they started throwing the posters onto the court that night uh, with Patrick there. You know, pictures and posters of Patrick, they're just throwing down on the floor to the point that PA announcer has to beg people to stop doing it. So, I mean, there's been much worse. Like, you know, I get that. Julius is frustrated. I get that the fans are frustrated. Fans are always frustrated when the team is perceived to be underperforming. Um, I think this is a team and a fan base that when the team's playing really hard and they're giving everything they have, that fans generally respect that. Um, There was always a chance the team was going to regress. They played above their heads last year, and I think it showed in the first round of the playoffs. Um, They didn't come back with enough this year, I don't think. Kemba Walker has not worked. I think even in the moments where Mitchell Robinson looks good, some of that might be him clogging the lane a little bit for someone like Julius. And Julius does not make decisions very quickly. And is trying to go one-on-one too much and is not as good a jump shooter as what he showed last year. Um, 
So, I mean, really what it comes down to is like the team probably didn't improve enough for how much the rest of the East did. Fournier has been very inconsistent other than when he's playing Boston. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so I think that they, they need a little bit more. And uh, you, you, I was thinking from their standpoint, you're banking on the fact that Kemba and Fournier make it easier for someone like Julius, but it just doesn't feel like that's really been the case. Like he still had the ball in his hands a lot this season and they need, I mean, they've also really missed somebody like Derek Rose who can just kind of break down defenses and you not need him, not need Randall and other people to hold the ball all the time. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, we'll see if he stays on the roster. We'll see if he's traded. Um, but I keep thinking about like, he might be a more valuable piece for you as a number two, you certainly will go a lot farther with him as a number two as, instead of a number one. Cause I just feel like he constantly has defenses draped all over him. And when he's at his worst, it's when he's not moving the ball quickly enough to take advantage of the fact that there's two guys keying in on him, which means someone else is left open. All right. Absolute last question. I apologize. I have to get this one in. So you've seen a more physical league and now we see the complete polar opposite of our current NBA solely on preference, which style of basketball do you enjoy watching more? This one, the current one. I really? Mean, what What I'll say is that I, I wish that there was a little bit more of yesteryear kind of infused into today's. Okay. Um, But not to the extent that it was before. Like, I don't want to see Kenny Anderson players and p- players like that that are skilled and talented breaking their wrist. Like, I didn't want to see Alex Caruso's wrist get broken. No doubt. Um, A, a few days ago, a few weeks ago, whatever it was. Uh, These guys make too much money. There's too much riding on it. Um, it's just not entertaining to see guys get hurt from my vantage point. Now, what I do miss, and I think most people miss, I, you know, I was four when Pat Riley got hired, so I wasn't like of age to have really enjoyed the '90s style stuff anyway. Um, but had to research it and watch it, and it's not good basketball. Like Doc Rivers was a Nick during those years, and he will tell you he'll be the first one to tell you, yes, the league absolutely implemented rules that disadvantaged us. He called them anti Nick rules in my book. He's also the first one to say, like, thank God they changed those rules because the league would have been so ugly and impossible to watch. So the league is a lot more interesting to watch now with a lot more skill. The guys have a lot more freedom to fly and dunk and and run the way they do. Um, The the thing I wish was changed around or that was different or more like before, I wish you had true rivalries. I mean, and I think sometimes some of the physicality that's built into those old series and those old games – is why you had the rivalries because these Definitely. guys just didn't want to be around each other. They're swinging on guys. Sure. An occasional fight or some, you know, guys getting hot under the collar can be fun to watch occasionally. It does. It didn't, it doesn't ever need to be what it was during the nineties though. I got, I wish the guys were a little bit less nice to each other, but the truth is they come up through AAU and they know each other before they ever get to the pros. So yep. I understand it. You know, Melo and LeBron have that sort of relationship. Um, I totally, totally understand it, but I wish there was a little bit more of bad blood between the the players and the teams, but the league is so different now and the guys change teams so frequently to where you really don't have those roots established. It's kind of sad. You get, you know, a, a Knicks Hawks Christmas game based solely on what happened last year and what wasn't even that competitive of a series. And so then when Trey young has COVID it's like, so what are we basing this Christmas game on now? Like he's not playing. So there is no rivalry between those two teams. It was just a team that happened to meet in the playoffs once where a guy shushed the garden and the league is kind of lighting a match, hoping that it sets on fire. And it's just, it's not that simple. Um, I think they wish it would be, mm-hmm. but you know, I don't know. I don't know what changes that dynamic, but I wish there were more rivalries. I missed that more than anything about the nineties. I don't think you need it for it to be a completely, completely physical game anymore. Cause it's, it's not pretty to watch and it's not, you know, it also hurts people depending on how physical it is. And we've talked about that on this show and how the only true rivalry that we see currently is probably between the Heat and the Bucks, simply because they face in the playoffs the last two seasons. And if they match up this year, I think it's going to be a hell of a series. Although the Knicks are bad now, I think if you are a Knicks fan or a basketball fan, you can reminisce on the glory days of the Knicks when reading this book, Blood in the Garden, about the 1990s Knicks, we want to thank you for taking the time out to join our podcast and talking about him. the book. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me and keep up all your great work. All right. Appreciate thank that, you Chris. Have a great night. That was Chris Herring on the pod to talk about his new book, Blood in the Garden. Make sure to check it out. Now on to the All-Star Reserves. They were named yes, this past week in the Eastern Conference, Jimmy Butler, Darius Garland, James Harden, Zach Levine, 
Chris Middleton, Jason Tatum, and Fred Van Vliet. And now to make up the West, it was Devin Booker, Luka Doncic, Rudy Gobert, Draymond Green, Donovan Mitchell, Chris Paul, and Carl Anthony Towns. What are your initial reactions to this list? Who was snubbed from the All-Star game? We know KD and Draymond won't be in it. So who are some possible injury replacements for them? What do you think, Riff? I'll start with you. Well, first of all, shout out to Darius Garland. You know, I'm happy for him. I'm glad he got into the All-Star game. You know, that's one of my guys. Um, in the East, I was surprised JB didn't make it. You know, I thought Jalen Brown would maybe get, I, I really didn't see Middleton. He was kind of like, a, oh, wow, I didn't notice he was, like, get in this year. I, I felt Decent like J, numbers. I felt like JB has been playing at a bit of a better level, but I understand the team's at a better record. He's missed time also. Yeah, so, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I get that part. In the West, though, like you said, I, I'm hoping for maybe, you know, Anthony Davis or DeJounte Murray to take Draymond Green's spot. Maybe DeJounte because he's played more games. You know, I thought AD was going to get it, even though he missed times because, you know, 24 and 10 is still, you know, all-star numbers. Of course. But everybody else, you know, Draymond Green, Rudy Gobert, Luca Donovan, obviously, I feel like those guys, they made the right call. You know, I feel like they got everybody. Sort of people in the East, I feel like they feel like LaMelo should have got it. But like we said, we had a segment on it between Garland, Van Vliet, and LaMelo. It was really hard, and the success is leaning towards Van Vliet now and Garland, of course. So, you know, Allen, you could have made the case for him too. But, like, looking at the East, I think only Middleton's the guy where you're kind of like, I don't know if he should be in. There's a couple guys you could probably put in front of him. But in the West, I think everybody on the reserves definitely should have got in. So I'm going to go with the list. I'm with you on the West side. I feel like there's no player I look here that should not be an all-star. Sure, you could say that DeJounte Murray deserves a spot, Anthony Davis for the numbers, but AD's missed too much time for me. DeJounte Murray just doesn't deserve it over these guys listed. There's no way you could tell me that I'm taking out Devin Booker, Luka, Chris Paul or Donovan Mitchell, even though Donovan's missed some time, he's still Donovan Mitchell. He's going to get in regardless. On the east side, I agree with you. I feel like I was very surprised that I did not see Jared Allen on this list. Chris Middleton is definitely on the cusp of being an all-star. He had an unbelievable playoff run, and he's been pretty solid this season. And I don't know if it was the playoff run mixed with playing relatively well. Solid offensive player, solid defensive player. So I feel like maybe that's the reason why they gave him the nod over Jared Allen or LaMelo Ball. LaMelo Ball's stats-wise clear, clears Middleton in every category, points, steal, uh, points, rebounds, and assists. Jared Allen, for the success that the Cavaliers have had this season, I feel like off that alone, him never having an all-star appearance, this really being the first season that the Cavaliers have been a great club since LeBron has left I feel like the Cavaliers should have gotten a little bit more respect outside of just Garland getting in but I understand Milwaukee's coming off a championship Middleton was a a huge part of that I don't know if that plays a huge factor into it truthfully he's been playing solid basketball both offensively and defensively and he's been a a previous all-star too so that might have played a, a, a role in him getting in but JB where I agree with you. I think JB is a better ball player than Middleton. I think JB's just missed a little bit too much time with injury. Points-wise, defensively, JB has been spectacular when he's been on the court. But I can't put him as an all-star right now. Other than that, I really have no issues. West is perfect. East East makes a little bit more sense of why I can see like LaMelo or Jared Allen getting in. But... JB is a little bit of a stretch for me personally, but the only one that I have an issue with is Middleton. You have Van Vliet, who's been playing excellent basketball. Tatum is Jason Tatum. He needs to be an all-star every year that he's in the league. James Harden, regardless of how I may feel about him currently, he's James Harden. He's got to be an all-star. That's that's plain and simple. Zach Levine, I had him as a starter. Either way, he was making this all-star team. And self-explanatory, Jimmy Butler and Darius Garland for, for both of these guys as teams that are having success and playing great ball. Chris Middleton is that guy that whenever he gets into the All-Star game, at least in the, in the in the past years, it was acceptable only because Milwaukee was on a pace for 60 wins and he's the second best player on one of the best teams in the NBA. But Milwaukee hasn't been that. They have been feeling the loss of Brooke Lopez. Chris Middleton being an All-Star mm, is interesting. Embarrassing. That's interesting. And embarrassing it's not, it's embarrassing. Crazy. It's embarrassing. Pascal Siakam deserve, deserves it over Chris Middleton far and you away. You know what? He missed he time. He said a good name, though. He missed time, you said, though. He, Pascal did you miss talk about, You talk about LaMelo. I'm not mad LaMelo didn't make it. You have Zach Levine, James Harden, Fred Van Vliet, Darius Garland, 
DeRozan and Trey Young all as guards. I mean, that's a that's there's a lot of guard depth. Am I ecstatic that Harden made the All Star game? No, I, I feel like Harden getting snubbed from it may have given him additional motivation for the entire s- season. I feel like right now he's j- he just doesn't look like he's playing motivated. I wouldn't have been. I wouldn't have been against him not making it personally. Just his efficiency is at an all-time low. I get it, averaging 22.5 and 10 assists, but he's averaging like 4.5 turnovers per game, and he's been very inefficient. Between the two snubs for me is Jared Allen and Pascal Siakam. Jalen Brown's up there as well to replace Chris Middleton. I thought Chris Middleton getting in was embarrassing. He has no case to be an all-star this season over those guys I mentioned. He really doesn't. And and, I, and I'm kind of annoyed that he got into the all-star game. Drew Holiday deserved it over him. I, I feel like he's he's more important to Milwaukee than him, in my opinion. I understand he had a great playoff run, but let's pump the brakes. Outside of last season, we know what he's been in the playoffs. And I don't take that playoff run into account for this season, all this season's all-star game. I just don't. Then I look at the Western Conference. I felt like they nailed it. The Western Conference was Perfect. flawless. Perfect. I didn't find any problem with it. Really, my question is, who's going to replace Draymond Green as an injury replacement? DeJounte Murray, I'm not even thinking about him. I know that's your guy. I'm not thinking about him. It's Anthony Edwards. Anthony Edwards should be an all-star replacement, and he should be in the all-star game. He's listed as forward, I believe, so he can get in. He deserves to be an all-star. Why? Because he's averaging 22 points per game in Minnesota with Cat. Cat was an all-star. They're the seventh seed currently and only two and a half games behind the fifth seed. Put respect on Minnesota. Put respect the on Johnson Anthony is Edwards. cleaning him in everything aside from points. And he's they putting are up top, 19 and they points are a game. top four. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Anthony Edwards is putting up more points. He no, said, no, I said, okay. I said, he said he's said cleaning him in points. everything but points, and DeJounte is averaging not 19 points Not, not three-point shooting. Not no, three I'm, point talking shooting about, not, I'm talking about assists, rebounds, and steals. He's cleaning him in okay, all Okay, and he's on the bottom three team in the West, bottom four team in the West. Why that's Why don't you want to put Brandon fair. Ingram in the All-Star game? Uh, that's fair. All yeah. right, so Anthony that's Edwards, fair. I think, should be an, he should be the All-Star replacement for Draymond Green. Um, outside of that, I thought the All-Stars were pretty good. Chris Middleton was disappointing. The West, I thought they pretty much nailed it, and I, I'm okay with it. Can I ask you a question, really quick? We don't have to make this a huge thing. Bucks are feeling the loss of Brook Lopez. They're a game and a half out of first place. They and are there's, the loss there of was, Brooke Lopez. There was a great stretch of games where no Giannis, no Middleton, Drew Holiday missed some time. I don't understand the feeling the loss of Brooke Lopez. Their rim protection has not been as good as it was last season with Brooke Lopez. I mean, they're still playing great basketball. They can be playing great basketball. No, it, does, it, it doesn't mean that Brooke Again, Lopez they're a game and a half out of first place. They're not missing Brooke Lopez. And they've dealt with injuries just like every other team. I see what you're saying. I see your point. I see your point. I think they're missing Brooke Lopez right now. Go ahead, JC. I pretty much agree with you know with everybody said. I think in the West they I mean they nailed it. Um as far as uh Draymond Green, I mean, I would give this spot to Anthony Davis just off pure respect. I mean, like you said, he's averaging 24 and 11. He's coming back. He's been showcasing that he's still one of the a top three big, top two big in the NBA. He's been killing it. Um, so with the West, I believe they nailed it for uh, Draymond Green's replacement. I would say Anthony Davis. I mean, as far as the Eastern Conference, I'm with everybody except Chris Middleton. Uh, I, like, I agree with Joel. I don't think Chris Middleton – is the second best player on the Bucks this year throughout this entire season. I think it's Drew Holiday. Drew Holiday shooting fifty percent from the field, basically forty percent from the from the three, averaging just about the same amount of points, more assists, better defender. But even then, I don't think Drew Holiday should I should have gotten in. Um, I'm a little biased. I like Jared Allen because you know I'm I'm you know he's a former Net and he's 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 really integral to what uh, Cleveland's been doing this year and them having this high of a record and being this high in the standings. So I, I I would you know I, I would rather have him in the All Star game Jalen Brown as well I think Jalen Brown even but a lot of my stuff is all viewership as well like I don't want to see Chris Middleton in like the All Star game like personally like I don't think he's that fun of a player to watch like Jalen Brown these type of guys can throw down dunks more athletic and all that stuff you know I mean I get the respect factor but then again Chris Middleton's missed a lot of time this year and his efficiency have been low he's shooting forty four percent from the field and about thirty six thirty seven from the three so he hasn't really had much rhythm 38. 38 he hasn't had much rhythm going going into this season so 
I'm all right with the East. Uh, like I said, I think Chris Middleton should have been replaced by Jared Allen or Jalen Brown. And I don't even think he was the most, most second-worthy Milwaukee Buck. I would have gave that spot to Drew Holiday because I think he means more to the team. And Drew Holiday this season is having one of the best seasons of his career, efficiency-wise. He's shooting basically 40% from three and about 50% from the field. You're getting great defense from him. And, yeah, so I'm I'm with it. I don't just... I don't know. Chris Middleton's good, but I don't think he's all star good this year. I mean, I, I understand Holiday not being in over Middleton. We have to understand this by positions, and yep. Holiday is not getting in as a guard. The guard mm-hmm. guards are just too stacked in the Eastern Conference. Chris Middleton last season didn't make the All Star game. He averaged more points. He averaged more assists. He averaged more rebounds. He was better from the field, forty seven percent. He's at forty four percent this year. He shot forty one percent from three last year. He's at 38% this year, and he was at damn near 90% from the free throw line last year and 88% this year from the free throw line. So, I mean, it's some, not a huge fall I mean, off. it's not a huge fall off, but he yeah. wasn't an all star last year with better numbers across the board. He he was more deserving of an all star last year than he was this That's season. That's why I say I feel like the playoffs have a little bit to do with it, in my opinion. The, co- the coaches. Go. Oh, listen, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I agree. No, no doubt about it, but the coaches are deciding here. That's, yeah, yeah, you're right. The coaches pick the players. So uh, I understand. I mean, like, like I, I think we can all agree. Uh, Chris Middleton is the one guy we're looking at. Like, we could have probably put a few more guys. Mm-hmm. But for me, yeah. I like the Pascal name, bro. Siakam, I really like it. Siakam has played 38 games. He's averaging 21, 9, and 5. He's been amazing. He's been one really steal, almost a block, 48% from the field, and 35% he's from been, three. He's been so but damn I, good. I feel like out of him... JB and Middleton. JB probably Tell has the best numbers. Tell me how many games numbers. JB's played. Yeah. I, you might be right. Points JB's wise, twenty five a game. But right? the facilitating of Pascal Siakam has been slept on. It's been great. His rebounding numbers. He's the lone big on that yeah. squad. He's going to have them. So Got Siakam it. has played thirty eight games. Middleton has played forty one. So it's a three game difference. JB. I know. I know. I was just getting to that. Oh, I apologize. Because you talked about earlier that Siakam was hurt. I mean, they've played damn near no, the same amount of games. No doubt. So now Jalen Brown. This year, he's averaging 24, 6, and 3. Shooting 45% from the field and 36% from 3. Played 40 games. So yeah, he's... He, okay. He, he should, I'm with you. He should he should have been that say. guy, honestly. Yeah, Middleton should, shouldn't have gotten in. Boston yeah, should have had two wings. And then, ridiculous. you know, the Draymond spot, I probably would put AD in that yeah. spot, honestly. Like, the one... The mm-hmm. two mm-hmm. Lakers. Mm-hmm. Over the Anthony Edwards? Well, I mean, you, you, you just threw all that stuff at me with DeJounte. Anthony Davis' team has more... Wins. He's been playing better as of are, late. Are, do, no, do they not have right more now. wins. Not right now. AFC. No, yeah. What's yeah. Minnesota? Seven. Nine? Seven or seven now. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they're right Don't there. Don't sleep on Minnesota, bro. I think Anthony num- Anthony Davis numbers are are better, and he's been playing at a phenomenal rate since he's been back. So it's like he's been going crazy. He's been came back. going insane. Yeah, he has. Yeah, he's not the best big in the league like you think he. Nah, is, he is. Jokic. He's better. You think he's better than Jokic? He's better. He's the best big in the league. That's what it means. He's better than everyone else. <laughs> when he's healthy, he's the best. Oh God! <laughs> he's better than Embiid. He's better than Jokic when he's healthy, no doubt. He's better than Embiid, no doubt, no doubt. Wow, he's not better than Jokic. Not even close. Not this year, bro. Not even close. Against the Nuggets, when they face, he busted Is his ass. AD an MVP? No, he's not. Again, he doesn't not. even play enough games to qualify for the award. Interesting. He doesn't even have the production <laughs> to qualify yeah. for the award. Weren't you the one who sat here and said that Derrick Rose wasn't even a top five player when he won the MVP? He wasn't. I agree with you. So what? I'm not it? saying that Jokic. What does D five. Rose have to do? with All this? I'm trying to say is that MVP isn't the end all be all. So you could still be better than somebody that's an MVP. Is I that agree. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could, but Derrick Rose won. Again, LeBron. Was LeBron Exactly. Yeah. That's a really extreme situation because Anthony Davis is not LeBron James. No, yeah. no, not no, th- no, he's not LeBron James. I understand. And it's a it's a real big difference because AD last year the Joker one too. The Joker and Embiid last year as Yoke, well. Um, excuse me. The, the Joker and, definitely the Joker and Embiid have been playing better than Anthony Davis the last two seasons, last yeah. year and this season. Yeah. So it's not like this right. is a whole different conversation. They've and both been better. Back to back years, so this isn't like this is the healthiest AD has been, and we're finally seeing him back to AD what's, form. What's the farthest that AD has ever taken? Led his team? second second round. round. What, what was Jokic? WCF right came because back from Jamal Murray. Three. 
But uh, nah, Jamal Murray was that, dynamic duo. Because, because, dynamic because, because he, played he, Murray, he played a huge part. Of course. Okay, so huge would you say the same about Drew Holiday and Rondo for yeah, Anthony Davis? Absolutely. Absolutely. They locked up. No, he locked, they locked, they locked, locked, they locked up Dame. No doubt. Rondo was no doubt. great. In that but you said too. because of Jamal Murray, like Jamal Murray was the biggest reason. I he might have been. No, he. They were a dynamic duo, bro. They were dynamic duo. They played off each other. Jamal Murray was not the biggest reason. Jokic was the best player in all of those series by far. You think you don't think he was the biggest reason? I mean. Me that, uh, Jamal Murray It yeah. was both or, or, I mean, Utah, or in that Utah series I think Where he had Jamal 250 was, balls Jamal was, was the impressive. best Offensive player In terms of like Scoring the ball He was that guy But joke, the Joker so scoring, Was still facil- mean, no. Yeah scoring like Scoring he, not offensive uh, so, Yeah scoring But Joker was still Facilitating the no, offensive no, yeah, yeah. Scoring The and reason still why the they got The reason why They were able to get Past the Clippers Is because they couldn't Double team Jokic Because he would just Kill them passing He was destroying them So it's yeah. like Jamal Murray I feel like it was A dynamic duo I'm not going to say One was bigger than the other So it's like 1A 1B Yeah I feel like They both Played up to that level, so you know what I'm saying. So I went, but don't act like the Pelic, like Drew Holiday and Rondo stepped their I'm game up. I'm not saying that they because they, they, they were six seed. They were all they beat game. Portland. Yeah, Drew, was CJ CJ was, CJ was also getting locked up, and Rondo was guarding him. Yeah. So and that's a good team, though. Yeah, so let's pump the brakes. I'm here. saying no, that Portland AD team was, was a good team. Eighty was averaged thirty and twelve. And Boogie got hurt that season too. He tore his ACL. Yeah, I'm just saying. You know, Drew averaged twenty eight that series. No, he was awesome. Yeah, he was awesome. Don't forget that. Don't try to make. Don't do that. And he shut down Dame. Primary defender on Dame. That's hard to do, man. It is. In the first round, Dame is an elite first like first round player. He's no elite at that. Early Drew rounds, literally Dame's. took him out See? as the primary guy. I got you. I'll do that. This <laughs> guy, AD. He probably yeah. still has the image of Jokic last year in the playoffs versus the Suns, and that's a. Uh, that's Jokic's the worst moment, moment in the lone playoffs. Lone moment where we really he, saw he's the worst. That's was, the worst moment for him in the playoffs. And uh, the Suns this year, they have been. You know, they're the best team in the in the in the NBA. Let alone the Western Conference, they are forty-one and ten right now. At the time of this recording, they're first in the West. Everybody talked about how last year might have been a fluke season. I mean, you were a big advocate oh, about that's, that. That's riff to a team. Um, and also, I just wanted to let you so know, in the in the off season when we talked about their easy playoff run and how they didn't have adversity, I was here defending Phoenix, saying Chris Paul. Had an injured shoulder and couldn't even dribble. You saw the he, JJ Reddick yeah, podcast. Yeah, he confirmed it on the JJ Reddick podcast that I couldn't even shoot. Nobody the ball. said you was wrong at that. Bro, time. he okay. said he couldn't dribble. Like he would put the ball on the ground and it wouldn't and come back just, up. Yeah. That's crazy to me. So the Suns went through their own fair share of adversity. Even though they're the best team in the NBA right now, record wise, do you think they are favorites to win the title right now? I'm pretty sure Vegas has the Nets as the favorites. I'm pretty Still? sure. Yeah, I, yeah, know, I, I, I don't think know why, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm you, pretty sure Golden State is above Phoenix as well. Do you think Phoenix is getting disrespected? I know we had this segment a couple, uh, yeah. a couple episodes ago, but I think the Suns just keep on winning. Oh, they've so earned we their, have to have it. Again. Of course, um, they've earned their well, spot. For in the show. starters, you keep bringing that up, and I've already admitted I was wrong in that department. But you constantly bring it up; it's crazy. But you know what? That's what we do. I'm gonna let you That's have that. Do. You know. I was wrong. I've admitted it already. But whatever. Idiot. Um, I don't think. I don't think it's disrespectful though. The Sorry, two teams in sweet. front. I didn't acknowledge you. I don't. Think <laughs> like, I, I didn't acknowledge you. But, um, the, the two teams in front of them though. I don't think it's disrespect. I mean, the Nets. Ah, if they're healthy, the big three. I think they're what they're. If Vegas is doing yeah. is they're believing the big three. If they're healthy, which if the big three are healthy, then you can put them. They're not it, trying to get beat by the by the. That's what I'm saying. Like a uh, healthy big three can beat any team in the league. So I guess that's what Vegas thought. And then the Warriors. That's the only team outside of the big three Nets that you feel like can beat the Suns, in my opinion. Like for all of us. So I think it's not disrespectful to have them, but I think like. What Phoenix has shown you is they should be the favorites as of right now. You know, they constantly keep on winning. You know, they keep on. They're the first team to get 40 wins. So I think that's pretty impressive. They've been the number one seed for a couple of weeks now, probably like a month or some change. So they've they've shown this consistency. But I don't think it's disrespectful because if you look at the Warriors and they're well oiled machine, they've been dealing with injuries and yet still they're still winning games. You look at the Nets, the big three hasn't played enough. So that that's still a wait and see process. Lakers. And Kevin Durant. You know he's been out, and they they look they look like they really like Kevin Durant's MVP case looks even better I when he's know, been out yeah. because they've been bad without him. So <laughs> it's like, but like those are the two teams. Winning. Those like I don't look at the Lakers as a threat to Phoenix. I don't think Memphis can beat Phoenix. I don't think Dallas, or Utah, like, yeah, Utah. Like you looking at it, Phoenix now, it's like bro, they're they're cruising. So I don't think it's disrespectful to put those two teams. I think in a scenario where if the big three is healthy, 
that team and then obviously the Warriors are the only two teams that can beat oh of course Milwaukee maybe you know Milwaukee in the series they beat them already so that's another team you could look at and be like yo Milwaukee could still beat them so Miami. I think I'm still waiting to see as well waiting to see on Miami I don't y'all I, are sleeping on Miami yeah, I think Miami could beat them sleeping. If they no we are sleeping and you know uh, what show us wake us up that's all okay. it is just wake all right. up. but I don't think it's disrespectful I think Phoenix is in the right position what are they missing Phoenix Nothing. Yes. They, they're missing a backup, a, a, a bench scorer. Eric Gordon. How would they get him, though? Cam? They just have to trade Dario Sarge, Jalen Smith, Cam Johnson. and somebody else. As a scorer? I don't think he's a, he's scorer. Not a scorer. I think he's, he's a good floor you're spacer. You're saying, like, give, like, you get the ball in his hands, he could put the ball yeah, in his like hands. Eric Gordon. So this trade works. It, I put it in the trade Eric machine. Gordon. Sarge, Jalen Smith, and Alfred Payne for Gordon. That yeah. works contract-wise. That would okay. be a good move. And the Rockets get Jalen Smith, who is an up and coming big man who showed some flashes when he got some playing so that's time. A, Eric Gordon would be really yeah. good for them. That would definitely help them out a lot. You know, you know that when Eric Gordon, when he first left the Hornets, I believe it was when he was t- well when he was testing free agency, the Suns wanted him, and they actually put up this whole presentation uh, in the on the jumbotron about how much they wanted Eric Gordon in Phoenix. Wow, yeah, he was actually really. That was good. a while ago though, but it did happen. Has Eric Gordon really been that much of a scorer this season? Charging 15. Agreed, but I feel like a lot of it is on, like, a lot of three-pointers, not really given the opportunity. Like, he's on the Rockets right now who I'm sure they want to get their young guys involved. However, if he's the scorer that he is, why isn't he getting more opportunity on this Rockets team that isn't the best? Cause you understand what I mean? Because there's a bunch of young players that need a That's need what I'm opportunity. Saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eric Gordon is a six man of the year. Yeah. Uh, he's he won this, it. This oh, you're saying yeah. in the past. Yeah, yeah he of course. Won he's it. been in the league for a while. He's been a very good ball right player. Right now, Phoenix I still can't put them over Golden State. If they get Eric Gordon, I will put them over Golden State. If you look at his past two playoff performances, he's averaged eighteen, then seventeen points per game. He shows up. He's a great defender. He 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 did a great job on Clay Thompson when they played. <laughs> I mean, and he locked up Donovan Mitchell when they played Utah. Like, he's a great defender. Right now, the Suns are 25th in isolation frequency. They're not a big ISO heavy team. They're 19th in drives per game. So they don't put a ton of pressure at the rim. And they're 29th in passes per game, which means that, you know, their offense is very pick and roll heavy. Because of that, I just feel like. They need somebody outside of Chris Paul and Devin Booker to put pressure on defenses. Outside of D-Book and Chris Paul, there's nobody on Phoenix that I say can consistently get to the basket and threaten defenses. Campaign is 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 definitely a guy who can do it. I like Cam Johnson on, a lot. Cam Johnson can't do so that. So you though. think Eric Gordon puts them over? Yes. I, if, if they trade for Eric Gordon, I will pick Phoenix to win the championship. That's, that's how much I believe in Eric Gordon. I think he's a great player. He I mean, is that's, a great so that, that just goes off your belief for Eric Gordon. Like Cam so Johnson's good. already averaging twelve points. Like he is a pretty good ball player. He's he's not he's a floor spacer. And he's a forty three percent. Hold up, Grand let D. me just name you these two teams come to mind. Golden State. They have Jordan Poole off the bench. Is Cam Johnson a Jordan Poole? No. Hell no. He's not. Miami he's an auto porter, is, bro. is Cam Johnson Hell no. Is Cam Johnson a taller oh, hero? Hell no. He's not. Cam Johnson is Otto Porter. But I feel like at this point in time, there's a lot of players in front of him right now. He's still a young guy. You still He's have 25. Who's in front in of there him? Or in this organization, you have Jay Crowder. You have He's Mikhail Bridges at his position. You still have Devin Booker. You have Chris Paul, who are going to get more opportunities than he is. They're just guys in his way right now. And, but, and he's still producing. They're better. I mean, he's producing. I don't I don't he's think playing, Cam Johnson is a bad no, player. He's, a, he's shooting Cam, 43% Cam, from three. Yeah, he's no, no, clearly. Cam, Cam is Johnson is Cam Johnson he's a has always player. Cam Johnson has always been a phenomenal three-point shooter, even dating back to his college days. It's actually surprising that. At, before this season, he didn't shoot forty percent from three during the regular season. Like he's, he's been in the league three shooter. years. Like I apologize for calling him a young player. Is that all right? He was, he's he a, just he drafted was a, he was a four year. Yeah, I understand. Mikel Bridges was drafted after him, and he's younger. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, Cam sat a year in college because he transferred, so you have to sit a year. Cam so. Johnson was a twenty four year old rookie, right? Or twenty three? Twenty four. Twenty three. It was twenty yeah, three. He turned probably twenty four in the midst. He's twenty five right now. So yeah, he probably turned twenty four in the midst. Of, but he was he had the city year in college because he transferred to UNC. Cam Johnson is good. I'm not saying he's not good, he's but good. Eric Gordon be, by far becomes their best six man or their best option off the bench if he goes to Phoenix. Like by far, he can give you eighteen to twenty any single given night, any single given night. 
and he's shooting 42% from three. Yeah. And he's a very gritty defender. Seen him on Houston. He's right now, their back of two guard is Landry Shamit, and he's inconsistent. Yeah. yeah they need about him. Yes. I, I think he last year, <laughs> I think last year their biggest problem was. He was, just can't guard. Last year, their yeah. biggest problem was back was big depth, center depth. I agree. But now they have it. They it doesn't matter whether it's Aiden, Biombo, McGee, killed. or Smith. They all step in into a role and play fairly well, mostly due to Chris Paul, in my opinion. I just feel like Eric Gordon is that player that takes him over the top. I really do. Or may, maybe he also like a Jeremy Grant, but Jeremy Grant would never accept a role like He's that. starting. He wants to start. He doesn't want to start. He wants to be a star. That's particularly starting. No, but that's like that's different. He wants to be the man. He wants to be the main option and keep his money. <sighs> Jeremy Grant is wild. You can still get paid though, and, and be a role player. He was pretty like, valuable on that Denver on that Denver team as well too during that bubble run. I don't he think really he wants valuable. to go back to that though. He doesn't no, no, want to go back to that role. He thinks he can do better things. <laughs> He can average better points. I don't know about winning. He won't win yeah, he won't. as a main option. I mean, <clears throat> you're looking at it, Eric. I mean, uh, Eric Gordon is definitely intriguing, though. It, off the it, bench, it is bro. intriguing because you got to look at the Warriors. They got Jordan Poole off the bench. He's giving you 17. The Warriors have depth for this. Steph, Clay, Dre, you know what I'm saying? They're auto Even ported. Auto like, it's like dudes. The they Gary got Payton. Yeah, Even they got, Kaminga. Yeah, Gary Kaminga. Payton. Now Kaminga's coming in. That's what I'm saying. Like, jam was nuts. Like, they so, their team is so deep. It's like, it's tough. They <sighs> Even JTA, Bielitsa. Bro, it's tough. That's why got I, a lot of players. I don't know. Eric Gordon won't fully put me over for them, but it definitely makes it makes them a better. lot. Yeah, it makes it a lot closer. I they, believe in Phoenix, man. I like the Suns a lot. I've said they it multiple just need, times. They just I think, need that they, I think the Suns are going to the WCF. No, they for sure are, but they yeah. need that one. They need one more player to get over. Anything less than the WCF is a failure. That's obvious. I will say the matchups that they've had this season have been interesting because game one, Booker goes out. The Suns still win. Then the next two, Warriors look very dominant. Christmas Day, Steph didn't have his best performance, and he, and they still won the game pretty easily. I just think it's a little bit different come playoff time. I understand the Warriors have the experience. Excuse me. I think I have the Suns. I think I have the Suns. I think personally right now, the way that CP3 has been facilitating the offense, if he is healthy, you have Booker who has been an unbelievable scorer, a top five scorer in the league right now, in my opinion. DeAndre Ayton, JaVale McGee, does not matter top who. Top five, you said? In my opinion, I think he. Oh, D-book? He, D-book right now. I just think right now, as a whole, they're playing excellent basketball, and I think they should be coming out of the West. You mentioned how in the playoffs is different. I think it's it that favors Golden State. I don't think playoff basketball favors Phoenix as opposed to Golden State. This is a seven-game series, in my opinion. The Ex- Suns' experience goes to the Golden State. For sure. Easily. For sure. No, I, really think, I agree. I, I think Golden State can beat them in six right now. I think this is a seven-game series. You bring it back to Phoenix, where Phoenix, I guess, has shown that they can be vulnerable. That being said, I think this home field advantage will give them the, the benefit of the doubt. Right now, who do you think is the MVP of the Suns? Chris Paul, Chris Paul, all day. Chris Paul, for probably me. Chris Paul because he does a little bit more. I'm surprised none of you guys have, are saying Devin Booker. Devin Booker is the offensive juggernaut, a he's scoring the best juggernaut on the team, but he, he's not the most important to the team. I don't want to sit here and, but he's he's improved a lot in his game. Like defensively, defensively he's gotten better to him. Sure, pad, but Chris Paul is the engine that he makes the, he makes the team go. Like he's Chris Paul and has defensive a track record too. He's he's still an anchor. Chris Paul's a track record. Uh, he's doing just, these you know what I'm saying? Like he's teams. he's the pilot, man. He just makes everything go. Yeah. So for he has to, for him, then the MVP doesn't mean he's the best player. Yeah. It's just he's the most, the most valuable. valuable. Yeah, he's the most valuable player. I mean, I feel like I feel like you know a lot of people argue if Chris Paul went out, I feel like if Devin Booker was out, the Suns would suffer too. So you know, it's not. You he know, book he, did go out. He went out and they, they won games. Too. But they're their offense, their offense, oh, do, it does take a hit. Of course, you're I mean, losing. I mean, that's in a regular season. Like, I mean. Yeah, I mean, we I mean, no, a, I, I always felt Chris Paul was more when valuable. When you have a floor general like that, you can miss a guy for a small like portion of time because you have that type of floor general that he just, just controls the game. The game. He yeah, just yeah, makes it's, people better. It's bro. like, yeah, it's like it's not always. It's not, it's not not a knock on Devin Booker. It's just when you have that type of floor general, the game gets a lot easier. Yeah. So it's easier to miss a guy like that for a short amount of time. You know, so it's it's tough. I mean, you said you got the Suns. That's a, that's a good pick, mm-hmm. boy. That's Thanks, bro. One of the better floor generals in the NBA right now is Trey Young. You can argue he is the best. 
You said, wait, what? Right now. Floor, oh, you said floor general. I thought you said floor raiser. I mean, floor spacer. Sorry. Trey Young is having a phenomenal season. And this this is a topic about Trey Young. Where do you rank him amongst the top point guards in the NBA? If you have a top five point guard list, you can set up to bat or a top 10 point guard list. You can set up to, you can step up to the plate. I want to hear where you guys stand on this. Where does Trey Young rank? You want me to go? Uh, yeah, you could go. All right. So, by default, you have to put Steph at one. You have to put Steph at one. Wait, this is just this season or overall? It's this season. Yeah, okay. we're talking this, this season. season. No, number two, he has missed some time. I still have Luca over Trey Young. Number three, I have Trey Young. Number four, John ja Morant. Probably number five. Chris like, Paul. Yeah, I was gonna say it gets disrespectful to not say Chris Paul. James I feel Harden. Uh, no. I'm 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 not gonna count him as a point guard for this. Okay. So, so wait, are we gonna count Luca? Yes. Luca's okay. a point guard. Uh, no, I'm just acting. Just, mm-hmm. just so I understand. Okay. chang has been great. I still just don't think he's better than Luca. Personally, this season his team's playing a little bit better and they're winning some ball games. But last season was a lot of it being the Luca show, and Luca almost got past the Clippers, who went to the WCF. It's almost, and you know what, that really doesn't count for much, but Luca in every playoff series that he's been in, which has only been two, and against the Clippers, who have both seasons had great teams, he's been arguably the best player in the series. So I think that I'm not going to hold it against him for losing because he has put his team in positions to win, and even still, this guy Luca is a walking triple-double if he wants to. He is spectacular can do everything offensively gets rebounds as well his defense could be a little bit better but we're seeing strides in that now that jason kidd has imp- implemented a new system over there i still would have put him over trey young but that's not to knock anything that this man is doing offensively he is one of the most gifted players in our league scoring shooting facilitating the basketball 29 and almost tennis is he averaging ten assists? i wouldn't be surprised 9.3 there, he's been Amazing for that Atlanta Hawks, and we're starting to see them start to creep into that play-in, close to that playoff spot. Atlanta's been playing really good basketball of late, but I don't know if he is over Luka for me yet. And Steph, he's having a bad a bad stretch of, I guess, 2022. He hasn't been the best since 2022 has started, but you have to give him his respect, his respect is due. His team is still top two in their conference, and he's the best shooter in the league still. Whether the efficiency is there or not right now, for years and years, he's just shown to be the most dominant point guard in the league. So I'm not going to hold a, a stretch of games for him, even though the season says otherwise, where he's averaging his career lows in field goal percentage and three-point percentage. It doesn't halt an entire career of being one of the most efficient players in the league. If they were losing because of him, maybe that would impact my decision. But even still, I have to show respect, even though, again, Steph's not one of my favorite players, but... That can't hold for me, hold me from my analysis of the game. So I have Steph, I have Luca, Trey, Ja, and CP3. There's only one player in the league who, when he's off the court, his team has a worse plus minus, and that's the Steph? Joker. Oh, no, really? That's the Joker. Oh, and then Steph. Okay. And my bad you know, Steph's team, we know they're as great as they are. When he's off the court, they're still trying to figure things out. Steph's lowest efficiency year is probably is is literally is still on par with Trey Young's John Morant's like even a low efficiency year for him is a great efficiency year for them we talking about just this season so I'm not gonna sit here and talk about what Steph has built up his reputation no doubt. so where he's cemented himself as the best point guard like I'm we're just talking about as of right now 40 games in or however many games it's been who's the best point guard in the league as of right now and it's been tough because like you said Steph went on a little Slum. He's been good. Twenty twenty last, last five yeah, games. Yeah, been really good. Mm-hmm. So you know, hopefully, he climbs back up. But uh, he had a really strong, a bad stretch where he just wasn't good. It was a lot of inconsistency. Trey Young. It's it's tough because his team wasn't good. But in terms of just him be in, individually, he's been playing like the best point guard in the league as of right now. You know, so for me, the, if we're talking just right now, I would go probably Trey. Ja, Steph, Luca, and then I would go Chris Paul at five because I just think Trey Young, him as and you know if we're, we're not talking teams today, we're just talking about who's been playing the best. Trey Young has been performing as like at all like at all time high right now. He's been great, and then for John Morant, he's just been box office awesome. every time he's played. 
So and Steph, that month really haunted him. So for right now, I can't put him at. Can I ask you this question? Talk to me. Let's say the season ended right now, right? And ESPN came out with the list with the best players in the league. Do you believe that they would have Trey and Ja over Steph? Because that's no, how I'm I, looking I think, at it. I think still what Steph has built up, they would still probably see. Because 40, 40 games isn't going to take away Agreed. what Steph has done. But that's but, how I'm looking at it. Yeah, but if we're talking just right now, you know, right, like as of right now, because obviously we still got to wait for the playoffs. You know, we still got to wait for the end of the season. But as of right now, it's hard to argue. Like Steph, the numbers, if you just look at the numbers, Steph is still there with those two guys. But we know from the eye test as of right now, Steph ain't been Steph not for Steph. a minute. And, but Trey Young and John Morant have been them for a really long time. So mm-hmm. those two guys, I got to put in front of me for me. But I think, like you said, if we end the season, Steph is still probably going to be the number one point guard in the league because it takes more than a year to take his crown. You know what I'm Definitely. saying? So, but for me, it's Trey, Ja, Steph, Luca, and then I'm gonna go Chris Paul at five. Uh, for me, oh, you want to go, bro? You can go. Oh, my fault. Um, yeah. So, you know. I have Steph Curry number one still, obviously. A, a span of a lot of bad games that he's been having recently isn't going to really sway my opinion on him. He's still the best point guard to me in the NBA. He gets that respect from me. Um, although this year, you know, he's been shooting 42% from the field and 38% from the three, which is, you know, that's un, un- Steph like But number two, I have Trey Young. I have Trey Young number as the number two point guard in the NBA. I mean, he's averaging th- – this is a season, and I was a person that came into the season – skeptical on if the foul rules were going to hurt Trey Young's game. He comes out there and has he's having the best season of his career. He's shooting 46% from the field, and he's shooting 38% from three on about nine attempts a game. He's averaging like 28 points and nine assists. He's just, he, as just on-court production, he's just been more productive. He's just been just a productive season. Um, Number three, this is kind of hard for me. Um, I'm going to take Luka as number three over John <coughs> Morant slightly. I mean, Luka Doncic is still putting up about 27 points, nine rebounds, nine assists. Uh, he's got off to a slow start, but, you know, as he's catching momentum this season and getting more into shape, which is something that, you know, that was something that was a uh, question. You know, question, question question mark on him. Um, yeah, I mean, Luka Doncic still, even last night, he had a triple-double. He's still that guy. Uh, John Morant, I mean, he's been box office this year, but I look at his numbers. His numbers really aren't up to par with the Luka or with the John Morant. I mean, or with a Trey Young or even with a Steph Curry, he's averaging slightly below in points, assists, and rebounds. And he's not really, I, I don't know, I, I don't want to sound disrespectful, but I, I'm not going to have one year of John Moran and put him over Trey Young, who's, I factor in playoffs as well and coming into the season as well. Trey Young just got to the ECF. However you want to square it, if Philly choked or whatever, he still got there. Lucas has been putting up dominant numbers in the playoffs back-to-back years against uh against the Clippers and then Steph Curry I mean I don't really have to talk about that and then to round out my list number five I mean I have Chris Paul I mean he's somebody that I think should be in the MVP conversation he's somebody that if you look at his raw numbers not really impressive but he's leading the league in assists averaging 15 points per game and he, I think he's just one of the most valuable players and leaders in the NBA so he's going to get that respect from me and I do think Although the numbers won't say it, I feel like he's having a better season than James Harden and a more impactful season. So that's why Chris Paul would round out my top five. So my top five would be Steph, Trey, Luka, Ja, and Chris Paul. So even if we were including Harden, you'd have him over. You'd have CP3 over Harden. Yes. Okay. This season. Trey Young is the best point guard in the NBA right now. And I'd say he's one of two point guards that have the most bragging rights coming into this season. Chris Paul is the only other point guard outside of Trey that can say, I was the main reason why my team went to the finals. Trey didn't make it to the finals, but he made it to the Eastern Conference Finals. Steph missed the playoffs. John Morant got eliminated in the first round. Luka Doncic got eliminated in the first round. Trey Young came to the season with the second most bragging rights, and he's averaging more points than any point guard in the NBA. Averaging more assists outside of Chris Paul because Chris Paul is currently one. And Trey Young shooting 46% from the field and 38% from three. He's finally shooting like the sniper that we all knew he was coming out of Oklahoma. You have something to say about that? No. What you were going to say, I thought 38% wasn't a sniper. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I, I, I mean, for the shots that Trey takes, it's definitely a sniper. That's why I didn't. Steph is still a sniper. He's shooting 39%. No, Steph is a sniper. He's a 38%. Yeah, Steph, is a sniper. Steph is a sniper because he shoot, he's he's Even a this year, he's shooter. been like a sniper, too. It's, you know, no, it's been do, you, kinda, do you think, bro? Yeah, you be remembering little details. <laughs> Question uh, Do you think last year Trey Young was better than Luca? 
No. Okay, I agree. I just want to see where your head was at. I really don't. I don't think Trey Young's better than Lucas still. So you're, okay. but you're, so you're. But Trey Young is, is the. Year. He's playing like the best point guard right now in basketball. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So okay. for shape man, how I just asked Riv before, a season ended right now, right? Mm-hmm. ESPN dropped their list. Do you believe that Trey Young would be the number one point guard? Mm-hmm. Of production alone, he should be. So I'm, that's what I'm asking you. So you believe this is how you're basing your list off of? This is my list. Based on this season, the top 10 point guards in the NBA have been Trey Young, then it's Steph, then Luka, then Ja, Chris Paul, Darius Garland 6, LaMelo 7, Fred Van Vliet 8, DeJounte Murray 9, and Drew Holiday 10. I'm putting Trey Young over Steph because I feel like Trey has had the better season. And you'll say the Hawks don't have the winning record. They're 8-2 and two in their last 10 games. They've been, good. They've been injured all season long. They're finally getting healthy. And Trey, he's been having to carry. You know, this roster right now that he has isn't much better than what he had in his second year in Atlanta. You know, they have gotten older. But Trey still has to carry this Atlanta Hawks team. The Golden State Warriors are 12-7 and seven without Draymond Green. You know, so they've they've missed the absence of Draymond. Trey Young to me is just the bet. He's playing like the best point guard in basketball right now. Went up against Phoenix the other night versus Chris Paul and three, D Book and that Suns team who have the best net rating in basketball by far in the fourth quarter and out clutched them at home. Mm-hmm. Trey Young has been the best point guard in the NBA and his rise has been amazing to see. Two years ago, I would have never thought I'd say he's on par with Luka. He's on par with Luka. They're neck and neck. Mm -hmm. And if you talk about resumes alone, and you talk about Trey just leading his team to the Eastern Conference Finals, Trey has the better resume. Their numbers are literally identical across the board when you measure those two. John Moran is creeping. And I wouldn't be surprised if after this season, we are now talking about John Morant, Trey Young, and Luka all in the same tier. John Morant's not too far off. And if you even want to base team success this season and you want to base this off team success, John Morant's over Luka this year. So is Trey Young a top 10 player easy? Yeah, he is. Uh, and Luka's a top 10 player. Uh, yeah. Because that's where I have the issue. It's T, I think you're, what's your, it's two different. He's going off just the 50 games we didn't play right now. Who Who's over Trey Young if we're talking about top 10? So obviously Steph. Um, KD, LeBron, KD, KD Giannis, LeBron, Giannis, Joel Embiid, Luca, Joel Embiid, Jokic, Harden, Harden's not Harden, not I don't, I don't think Harden, so either. Harden, James Harden is not a top ten. He's player not. Right now. No, wait, not. Wait, 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 wait. You didn't ask. You said who's a top ten player. You that just, was the question. You talk about right now. Right now, James Harden is not a top ten player. Oh, right now, no, he's not uh, playing like a top right ten. Now. No, 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 no. But J- that's the thing. Top Jason 10? Tatum or or Trey Young. Trey Young is better. I think it's close, but I Trey Young. You don't. Trae Young. That's, that's a tough, tough question. Trey Young is better than Jason Tatum. Top ten. I think play, it's pretty close. When you when you top most of the top ten, like when you're a top five, top Anthony eight Davis, players, Trey is better than Trae, Trae, Trae. This year, Trey's been like, better. That's that's so easy. Like you guys are saying that too easy for my liking. It's no. It's, it's he has been, been. He's been better this year. Guys. Sure, he's been crazy. This but again, that's what I'm we've saying. Seen what last year too. Because look, look, yeah, AD was underwhelming last year. Last year, when we were 25 games in, Steph was the clear cut. Like he was, the, he was one of the best players in the league. Like he was a top two player in the league. Twenty five games in, now we're fifty games in, and we're changing it to Trey. So my thing, I'm is, not doing that. No, I'm saying, but my like, I'm, my thing yeah. is with reg, it's hard to just say pinpoint it in the middle of a season. Yo, who's been the best? Who's been the best? Like it's really an end of the season. Discussion. What do you look like thing? Because at any moment it can change. At at a moment it was looking like Ja. Now it's looking like Trey. Steph was looking clear. Luca's looking good again. LeBron well, was again. looking ridiculous. Now Anthony Davis looks great again. So it's like it's it's really a. It, it it changes throughout the season. It's but a long season. But what's been consistent and what's what like because this isn't I don't like like in football obviously it changes year by year. But with basketball it's different. A top ten player usually it's been the consistent guys because they've shown the consistent elite success you, year you in. Have Trey on top ten. I'm not saying that. No, I'm, I'm just saying, asking. What that I'm was saying, the question. Yeah. What, what I'm saying is that you said James Harden no, mm-hmm. and what I'm He's saying not. is that's tough to say because James Harden on a bad year. Still giving you twenty four and ten. Okay, last right, right, year right, twenty five, right. eleven and nine. Right, right, so right. It's like on a bad tough, in, in a bad year. Harden's doing that, and we we've talked about this before on the show when we compare Harden yeah. and DeRozan. You think DeRozan's having a better season? Yeah, there's I no touch, doubt yeah. about that. And I think you know at this point I can say I agree with you. you DeRozan's think? not anywhere near a top fifteen player this year. 
this year. What? He's not. This mm, year, no, he's, he's not. Th- right as of right now. <laughs> if I'm taking, I'm, I'm. Are you taking Jimmy? Are you taking? Are you taking, over are, are you taking Jimmy Butler over Demar? Absolutely. Are you about this season, what are you You're telling me? I said this season. This season. this season, Demar's been better than Jimmy Butler. Than, than JB. Even though he's been yes. better, I don't think he's a better player. But that was okay, the question. So that, that's, you said that's, this so season. So you think? That's oh, why so you think Trey's the better player than James Harden? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Oh, right okay, now, okay. he is. I, right, so yeah, I get what you're yeah, saying. I get what you're saying. I know because it's a different question. It is. It is. If you're saying you saying he said Demar, so you're saying from, from, from now going on forward, you have Trey Young over James Harden. Yes. Okay. That's and I have a better way to put it. I do too. Okay. That, that's. Okay. I think James Harden this year has really dropped off to the point that he's removed himself from that discussion. Like if wow. fully healthy. Well, James Harden is fully healthy, but if this player comes back healthy, I would put him over James Harden too. That's Paul George. I think Paul George has surpassed James Harden this season. Do you think Jason Tatum is better than Harden? No. No. Is your heart breaking as you talk? <laughs> no, I mean, it's not. I mean, I think these players are phenomenal. I mean, it, it's what happens. Like, yeah. LeBron James is the anomaly in that he's an old player that is still playing at a high level. God bless James you. Harden. Level. James Harden's thirty-two. Russell Westbrook's thirty-three. We don't have Russell Westbrook any as a top twenty-five player right now because he's aging. And right now, Harden with those hamstring issues. It's the same thing, you know. If I'm Atlanta, I wouldn't prefer Harden over Trey Young on my team. But I wouldn't prefer Harden over Jason Tatum. Is Harden about to become the new Russell Westbrook? Mm. No, I don't know. It's too early to we say gotta that. See bro. A cha- we got to see. I seen. I seen an article that said that James Harden is is current. He currently is Russell Westbrook, just shooting better. I think it's too early to say that. I think we have to give a little bit more respect to who James Harden is. I understand. Yeah, like we, f- we we really can't forget like who he is. Let's yeah. let's pump but the he's bricks not, and he's, wait. He's not like what he used to be. Yeah, in but Houston, let's, let's like, still it's not even it close. Time, the big bro. thing about this and why I really have struggled with James Harden this season is he has always, and I mean always, been an excellent ten out of ten regular season ball player. He hasn't been that this season. Our biggest worry has always been. In the playoffs. Now, you're telling me he's struggling in the regular season. Where he excels at. And now I'm supposed to still put faith in him coming around this time in the playoffs where he's already struggling. I'm just saying pump the brace on the Westbrook thing. That's what I'm saying. Let's let's here's a better than Westbrook. Yeah, he is better than Westbrook. He's better than Westbrook. Here's a better question. If James Harden is in LA with the Lakers and having the season he's having with Brooklyn. Is he not getting the same backlash Westbrook is getting currently? No and doubt. They, and they currently have the same record. You like think that he were? would have the season he would have if he played with? I think their the record L- would be the better. Lakers? Their record would I mean, be way better he with was James playing Harden playing with KD, and he was still not. They were number the one heart. in the East. Agreed yeah. for sure, but that's but it's a lot to KD. Kevin Durant, a lot yeah. of KD. True. He was playing with KD, and he's still inefficient. Is what you're saying? Correct. Basically. Correct. True, Essentially, true, true. he just doesn't look the same this year, bro. Just honestly. Mm. His offensive game has been inconsistent. Too inconsistent Very for my inconsistent. liking. He'll have two, three stretches of great games, and then he'll have a game like in Sacramento where he's, he's two clearly for 10 capable of points. dropping those masterpiece performances. We know James Harden hasn't been his ho- his old self this year. I think him playing in Brooklyn is helping overshadow what you know how how much of a shell of himself he is currently. Yeah. Because let's be honest, nobody cares about Brooklyn. Like no nobody watches their games. I don't. At least I don't I think do. so. I, yeah, you watch. <laughs> I'm a Nets you're, you're a Nets yeah, fan, yeah. <laughs> but Brooklyn is not. Uh, even though they're in New York, they're not a big media market. Like they're not. You don't a, think KD makes them that? I kind of bite back on extent, that because they're 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 in the news and the media all the time. Bro. I agree. But they're so. they're usually in the that. news for because like it cuts out. Kyrie. They're usually in the news because no, of Kyrie. Can I also ask this Kevin question? Kevin Durant too. And then we'll we'll move on because we've been on for a little while. Are you taking Kyrie Irving or James Harden? Kyrie. I, I couldn't agree more personally. If, I think he means more time, to the Nets, if they're in my time, opinion. If they're That's the thing, though. Players, if they were full-time, one's not full-time. So give me James Harden, though. I'm just, I'm just keeping it. That interesting. interesting. Kyrie's not full-time. But bro. right now, right now, who's the better player between Kyrie's James Harden and Kyrie? Kyrie's looked really bad these last three games. Like, really bad. I, um, can't, I can't answer that. Yeah, I don't think I, it, I think that's that. a disservice to James Harden, who's been there all season. Kyrie's a just like, answer. Who do you think's had, a better ball player? If you want to ask me, last year I was. No, saying, I'm saying like I think James Harden I, is a better ball player than Kyrie. Yeah, yeah. Last year, Ky- Harden was better than Kyrie. Yeah, I, mean, I know. I think Kyrie like I'm Harden is a that, better that's ball That's what we're gonna have to base Kyrie. it off of. Kyrie's only played like five games, bro. I'm not gonna do that to James Harden. Look, I want to give James Harden the benefit of the doubt, but being a fan of his and sticking up for every single playoff choke that he's had, every single disappointing playoff run that he's had. 
is tiring. And defending him at this point in time is flat out embarrassing when he's repeatedly put himself at odds with other star players and he's forced his way out of two situations. He forced Dwight Howard out of Houston. I know Dwight Howard. Dwight Howard was a shell of himself at that time. He wasn't who he once was. He forced Chris Paul out of Houston. Bad. He gave the Rockets front office an ultimatum. You either trade him or you trade me. And that's why the Rockets ended up with Russell Westbrook. And that didn't turn out too good for them. Since he gave the Rockets that ultimatum and Chris, he basically, they basically sent Chris Paul out to rot in OKC. Rot, right. OKC makes the playoffs. Nobody expected it. Nope. He was a mentor to Shea who that year had a breakout year. And then the very next year, He's Had blossomed. an even better year. He's blossomed into a star. Then goes to Phoenix. His first year there makes the NBA Finals. Another guy that won a championship that was with Harden in 2018 and 2019, P.J. Tucker with Milwaukee. What about Trevor Reza when he was my, with, with Miami? Oh, they, they, I'm pretty sure every player that started for, with James Harden made the Finals. It was Chris White Paul. Won one. Dwight won. You're right. PJ it was got one. it was Chris Paul, Trey, Trevor PJ, Reason. um, Clint Capella made the ECF with Atlanta. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I forgot who else. But back to my original point. You said Reza? I did say Reza. Back to my original point. He forced Chris Paul out of Houston. They are now three years removed from that situation. Chris Paul has made the finals. He has led a team to the playoffs, took Houston to seven games. Harden. Didn't play well that series when he was guarded by Lou Dort. Lou Dort really put, put the hell. clamps on him. Facts. And it, and, it, and it looked bad, that series. It really did. And now this year, Phoenix might go to the finals again. They have the best record in the Western Conference. While James Harden has lost in the second round, was embarrassed by the Lakers. He played well. I'll give it to him. But ultimately, the Rockets didn't reach their ceiling, quote-unquote, Because he forced CP3 out for a lesser player in Russell Westbrook. They didn't reach their ceiling? They only made it to the second round. No, he's talking about the Russell Westbrook. They didn't reach their ceiling with Russell Westbrook. The team had a far better chance to win with Chris Paul than with Russ. That's just a fact. He forces his way out of Houston in an embarrassing fashion. Comes out of shape to training camp. To the point that you have John Wall and DeMarcus Cousins calling him out. James Harden has never been a leader in his career. Kevin McHale, his former coach in Houston, said he wasn't a leader. Mm-hmm. James Harden that. responded, didn't take accountability, and said he's just a clown. Yeah. A Hall of Fame player who's won multiple championships, you are just giving him the sidearm just because he called you out. Because it's true. James Harden does get passive in the biggest moments. Any superstar you name in NBA history who has more playoff blunders than James Harden? You can't James name Harden one. has the record for the most turnovers in a playoff game of and, all time. And now, so he forces his way out of Houston because he wants to go play with KD and Kyrie. He gets his wish. Granted, last year, injuries were the reason why I believe they didn't win the championship. But now this year when KD's hurt, Kyrie's a part-time player because he's standing up on his morals with the vaccine. Whether I agree with it or not is not the point. James Harden now is disgruntled with the Nets organization. It looks like he's unmotivated and now wants to, wants to force his way out to Philadelphia. Harden in the last two years has forced his way out of two situations. The two best co-stars he's ever played with and Dwight Howard and Chris Paul in Houston, he forced them out as well. We have to start looking at James Harden as the problem. Mm. And him not performing in the playoffs to his regular season level doesn't help out his case. So at this point, I'm done defending James Harden because the Nets with Kyrie and KD are better than any variation of players that Philly can have. That's just a fact. He went to Brooklyn to get an easy championship. And now that it's getting extremely difficult, he wants to leave. Mm. The same thing that happened in Houston when they... You know, I didn't think the roster was crazy bad last year. It really wasn't. I think he could have made the playoffs with that roster. But, of course, I defended him because you want to win a championship, and they weren't going to win a championship. 
But you're telling me with, with Christian Wood and Eric Gordon John and Wall. John Wall, you couldn't make the playoffs. They could have made the playoffs. They absolutely. still had PJ too. Yeah, they could have made the playoffs. Absolutely, and they the could have made the Harden playoffs. Harden was playing last season, probably. Because of that, I just can't defend James Harden anymore. It's gotten to that point because this is embarrassing. It's what he's doing is embarrassing. So what's going on? Are you a fan of his still? Are you going to support him? No, still? I'm. A, I'm a big fan of James Harden. He will always be my favorite player. But just because he's my favorite player doesn't mean that I can't call out what's bullshit. I agree. And what he's doing is bullshit. I agree. And I think I just don't agree with how he's handling this situation. I didn't agree with how he handled the Houston situation. It feels like he wants admiration without having to earn the fan base's respect. In Houston, he got the admiration. Deservedly so. You took them to eight straight playoff appearances, two Western Conference Finals appearances, that fan base loves you. Nets fans, Brooklyn fans, don't owe him anything. They don't owe him loyalty or respect. He's done nothing for that team. He's brought nothing to that team. They owe him nothing. And it feels like because he's not as welcomed in Brooklyn as he was in Houston, he now wants to be in another situation. I've already said this before in, on Twitter. He's not going to work out in Philly. He's not. If he if he plays like this in Philly with this efficiency, is that media not going to eat him alive even harder than what Brooklyn and Nets are doing? Philly is a vicious city when it comes to their athletes' performances. I just don't think Harden is built for that type of pressure. Look what they did to Ben Simmons. Let's just talk about that right now then. James Harden getting traded. Before we do that, okay. a quick <laughs> word from our sponsor, DraftKings. The moment we've been waiting for since September is finally here. In honor of the big game, DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of Super Bowl 56, is giving new customers 56 to 1 odds on either team. Bet just $5 to get 280 in free bets if your team wins. DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in New York, meaning you can bet from almost a third of the country. If Sportsbook isn't available in your state yet, play DraftKings Daily Fantasy Football Contest. For Super Bowl 56, new customers can get a free shot at $1 million top prize with their first deposit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code TBPN and get 56 to 1 odds on either team. Bet just $5 and get 280 in free bets if your team wins. That's promo code TBPN at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of Super Bowl 56. Now, before we talk about Harden and Philly... And what that can mean this week in the NBA. What was something that stuck out to you this week oh. in the NBA that you want to highlight? Uh, Riff? Well, I want to highlight me personally. He's the greatest coach in NBA history for me, Greg Popovich. Um, he's the first coach. Over Phil? Yeah, for me, it's. it's Whoa. I, 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 got, I got Greg as number one. For me, he's first coach ever to Bulls get fan 15, and taking Greg. 1,500 wins as a coach. I thought that amazing. was uh, yeah, an impressive, amazing, you know, the steady steadiness from Greg Popovich the tough mindset that you know military brain he got I feel like for me personally he's one of the he's the best coach of all time and if you have Phil over him I, I can't mm-hmm. hate on that for me Greg Popovich is one so shout out to him you know his young squad they a tough team this year you know they don't get a lot of wins but they make every game competitive so you got to show some respect to them and he got DeJounte Murray playing at a high level so for me that's that's what I'm gonna say this week in the NBA Joe Ingles unfortunately Torn ACL will miss the remainder of the season. Tough. Who? Uh, Joe Ingles. Yeah, that sucks. And that does suck. However, his numbers this season are just not up to par with what Joe Ingles has been in terms of shooting. Last season shot 45% from three, which is insane. And it was probably unreasonable to expect him to shoot around that mark again. But dropped down to 34% from three-point range. Dropped down in points per game. He's down almost five points per game. He's really struggling this season. But... I don't want I'm that's kind of horrible to say after I just said he tore his ACL. Um but I do want to wish him a speedy recovery, of course. Uh the way that the Jazz are playing right now I'm not saying that it's solely due to that, but there's a lot of things going on with the Jazz right now. There's a bunch of issues going on internally between Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell where apparently they're quote unquote under each other's skin where they can't 
they seem to just have some issues right now and they can't mend them. Then you have Joe Ingles going out. It just seems like a lot is going against Utah right now. It shows in the in the in the win columns right now. Last season they were a dominant number one seed. This year they're fourth in the Western Conference. They don't they look like a shell of the Utah Jazz that we saw last season. And it's interesting to see what's gonna go on with Utah come playoff time. I've been very consistent. I'm not the highest on Utah. And they're definitely not proving me any more wrong with the way that they have performed this regular season. And similar to, to Harden, they're a dominant regular season team, struggled come playoff time. Now we're seeing them struggle in the regular season. Fourth in the Western Conference isn't struggle, but in terms of how we were projecting them earlier in the year where they were supposed to be fighting for at least the number one seed. Donovan got hurt. True, and and... and but that's just what comes with the Utah Jazz right now. Donovan has, at least these last couple of seasons, has has been injury prone. It's unfortunate, but he when when Donovan's on, they go. It, it's that clear. And both him and Rudy have been missing some time also. So it's a matter of health with these guys. But at the same time, they need to get it together. Uh, by this week in the NBA, is kind of something a little funny. Um, I kind of found it interesting how Shaq and Ben Simmons had like a little feud. I nice. heard that they went back and forth. And, you know, Shaq obviously didn't want to explain, you know, obviously what was said between the two. But um, it just got me thinking just a little bit more in the grand scheme of things is Ben Simmons has a lot of proof. A lot of people, for the right reasons, have been out on him as a player or about him as uh, developing as well or reaching his full potential. So Ben Simmons has a lot to prove. And another thing that I also did find out for this week in the NBA is Ben Simmons recently just got vaccinated. So I don't know. I, I don't like per se. I don't know like if that really means that he's going to be on the move this year or whatever or whatever the case may be. But that's kind of interesting how right before the trade deadline he's getting vaccinated. Oh, so, so maybe you know maybe something could be spewing in the background. Maybe this could be the Daryl Morey pulling the trigger on the Nets or whatever the case may be. So yeah, a lot of this has for my uh, NBA uh, today has to be uh, centered around Ben Simmons. You know, just the outside noise, him getting vaccinated. I think it's all going to tie into into one really soon before the trade deadline because I do think he's on the move. This week in the NBA, the Timberwolves have scored at least 120 points in four straight games. That is their longest streak in bugging. franchise history. And my guy, Anthony Edwards, who should be an all-star replacement, said, in five years, I want to be the face of the league. Mm. And have a couple of MVPs by then and have a ring. I love his confidence. In five years, I would expect to go to the finals for sure. And I will say this. Not only will the Timberwolves finish with the fifth seed in the Western Conference this season, because that's still going to happen. And I haven't forgot about it. And I know my Minnesota my Minnesota fans love me. I love the Vikings. I love the T-Wolves. <laughs> let's, let's go Minneapolis. I love the city. Got to visit the city for sure. This team will make the finals within the next four years. With Edwards and Cat, and they're going to try to be aggressive to get some pieces now. They talked about some Marcus. Maybe Marcus Smart could come in. I'm telling you, Minnesota's on the rise. They have two superstar players in Cat and Edwards. You don't think Cat, D'Lo has superstar? D'Lo's an all-star, mm -hmm. which is super important. Yep. You two, What's a super team? Two, all, two superstars and an all-star. D'Lo's, I mean, Edwards is not quite at the superstar level yet. He's too inconsistent. But next year, and really in his fourth season, right, he's year. going to be a superstar in the NBA. I'll tell you what, Ben. I mean, if they could keep the team together, which to me is the biggest issue. If Cat Yeah, and they signed Jared Vanderbilt. He's going to be here. Bro. <laughs> you, you know who Vando is? <sighs> Anthony Edwards is a dog, dude. He's, he's amazing. You said finals in how many years? Four. Within the next four years. Within the next four the, years. The, my the only thing that I could could push back on it is if Cat stays through the through the years. If, I'll even if, say this. I'll even say this. I'll go as far as saying this. We view the Memphis Grizzlies as the next team up in the West. Because they've actually shown it. It's actually Minnesota. I'm pre if if one of those teams makes the finals within the next four years, That's unfortunately, where Minnesota will be the first one to do it. He lost me. That's where you lose me, King. Men Men Memphis is a well-built team. I feel like right now, Grizzlies have been playing great basketball. And Chris Finch has been a phenomenal coach for the T-Wolves. He's really? really implemented a defensive system. 
that is that is quarterbacked by D'Lo. Who would ever thought D'Lo is the one calling out defensive assignments? I mean, he's changed up his game. He has. I'm Minnesota is is finally for real this time on the rise. It's not it's not just a whole like they're gonna really feel they're gonna really finish the season out strong. Well, Cat's contract's up in two years, so that's, hopefully that's my you know, that's my hopefully concern. He sees enough to stay. Memphis, there's no comparison. I'm sorry, I get it. Memphis, Minnesota's the real team. No, Memphis first round last year. Are you in on Memphis? They're top. I'm not gonna say I've been telling. I've been telling you, Riv. It's on Jaron. Ja- it's on Jaron Jackson. Like it, and Jaron Jackson's been bugging. I know, but he hasn't been all Cohen star, defensive player of the year, superstar. You know, like uh, Jaron Jackson has to take that leap into all star, like like consensus all star. He, but I he think hasn't. He has our, our, my thing degree. is, he hasn't done it, and they're a top three seed in the league. I mean, no, the I West. Know, He's know. been so, playing very good yeah, this year. So like they have great depth. Comparing them, you comparing can't Minnesota to the them playoffs. is kind of crazy. But five years. I mean, I just see Minnesota, and I think you look at the, you look, two you look at the top. Co- yeah, they have two. That's the same thing with um, Memphis. Who's the other superstar? Jaron Jackson. You think he's gonna be a superstar? I think he could be a superstar. Mm. You would bank on it more than Anthony Anthony Edwards being a superstar? No, I wouldn't bank on it more. But Jaws already there. Yeah, Jaron yeah, Jackson. Jack, and Cat Cat is right there. Ah, Cat's uh, a superstar level Kat's player. Cat's a superstar level talent, but uh, we don't like that's still his Jaws production there. Is superstar. I mean, production, production. production has, to, re- numbers has are, to show results. Cat's, Cat's numbers are out of this world. No, Cat, it, result, production has to show results. Cat is a superstar. Anthony Edwards will be a superstar. That's crazy. Cat's you a superstar. Cat, okay, let me ask you that's, this. That's let me, tough, let me, that's, that's river, tough river. to say. Let me ask you this. Tough to say. Which big three are you taking for the next three years? Just these three. Ja, Jaron Jackson, Desmond Bain, or Cat? Edwards and D'Lo. Yeah, I mean that's an obvious answer. How's that an obvious answer? The thing with me, why I choose Memphis is I like their depth. The oh, so bi- you're you're choosing Memphis? Like, no, I'm t- the top three questions. But that's what I'm saying. Okay, okay. Which is what I I lean your side because okay. the names uh-huh. alone. Because D'Lo is more talented Tat- than and D'Lo. Bain, correct. I would, and Jaron Jackson is big. Is, but I actually think I, you know I wouldn't be opposed to putting Bain over D'Lo. I'll be honest. For me, it's really about Edwards. I think is gonna. Sir Pat, I think he's already better you could, than Jaron Jackson. You could low key say that Jaron Jackson's the fifth best player of the guys we listed. So you have oh, um, oh Ja, Cat, Anthony Edwards, D'Lo? D'Lo, and then Jaron Jackson. Right now, yeah, but he's also you think D'Lo's he's also, better than Jaron Jackson? I think Jaron Jackson's so. better than D'Lo. I don't I think so. You can, you can say that, but he's also the young, like one of the youngest out of all of them. So Jer- no doubt, Cat's twenty five, D'Lo's twenty five, twenty six, one of those twenty five. Anthony Edwards is the youngest. John ja Morant is John ja Morant and Jaron Jackson are literally younger than all but three Jaren, of them except like, Edwards. Like these two, like I, I get it, and listen, I get what you're saying. Cat has the numbers, I get it, but Cat, I think Cat, like we're gonna. This is Cat. John Morant and Jaron Jackson are literally still ascending, and they're the third seed in the West. Like, do y'all are we do not? You see Jaron Jackson ascending to higher uh, levels than Carl Anthony Towns. I don't think he needs to though. Can Even you? He, can uh, defensively, you, he's already defensive, yeah, but he's nowhere near him offensively. No, nah, I don't think no, no, he no, needs no, to. I wouldn't say. Yeah, to Cat. No, he's nowhere near I him think, offensively. I think Jaron Jackson in the post. Nah, you're bugging. In the post, I don't know. Jaron Jackson can get busy. Nah, he's not. I mean, he's, he's not on Cat's level. He's only averaging like six points this season. Let me let me ask all of you guys this actually. John Morant is the best player out of all the players that we listed in year three. Are we so sure that he's going to end up better than Anthony Edwards? I think Edwards is going to be a superstar, and I, I'm I'm not qu- I'm not quite out on Edwards Why are being you out on Edwards better than Ja. I don't know. I'm not out. Can on Can Edwards not be better than Ja one day? It's tough. It took maybe. it took Ja what he's in year three. three. Edwards is in year to, two. Relax. To, to average and Edwards 20, is also to average twenty five. You're looking Edwards, at it from a numbers standpoint. I, I understand, but this is year in year two. In year two, Ja literally he, he may not have shown improvements in statistics, but he improved on the court. They got to the playoffs and what round are, one. And Ja and Ja were doing. Timberwolves are making the playoffs. They're we didn't. He didn't get there the Grizzlies yet. Grizzlies were nine. There. By the way, excuse. Yeah, they yeah, were nine, not, and they, and they and got in. And they got because in of the player. Yeah, they got in by the plan. That's literally helping them right now. They're the seventh seed right now, but that can change next week. But they answer me, answer me the question, that spot, bro. But Riff, answer me the question. What's the question between Anthony Edwards and John Morant? Are you which one are you projecting to be the better player? John Morant. John Morant. You think it? Do you think Edwards has a chance of surpassing Ja? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, now I, I feel would, a little would, bit better I about you laughing. definitely has a chance to be better. But I think, like... I'll be honest. Like, 
I know Ja's exceptional. Ja's going to surpass Cat, bro. Like, that's, no, he's, that, a, he's already yeah, surpassed Yeah, so it's like, that's he's like, like I think Jerry Jackson can surpass Cat. And maybe not nah, in the no. maybe not in the numbers, but in terms of just impact on the team, I think Jerry Jackson can definitely, like, like we we glorify Cat and he's the superstar but talent. But not you guys, just, re, not you guys, I apologize. Weren't you one of the guys saying that Cat could be better than Anthony Davis? I feel like not too long ago what? you were saying that to me. Yes. I don't what think you, he said that. I did put, not say that, Who put the bro. poll up of Cat and Anthony Davis? No. What? What? Did you not put that on the pick aside? I said who was having a better season. I didn't say he was better than Anthony Davis, oh, bro. Well, excuse on, me, bro. Excuse me for that. Don't put, don't put that bad what take on me, bro. What do you mean, bro? I was asking don't, a question. Don't don't you were on the pick me, aside Twitter, yeah, which is why I was that. curious. We'll, we'll, end, we'll end this segment with this. In the next five years, who will be the better player, Anthony Edwards or John Morant? I'll start with you. Job. Oh, getting put on the spot like this sucks. I'm gonna say Anthony Edwards. I'm gonna say John Morant. I think Anthony Edwards is gonna be the better player. You guys are insane. And I think he's gonna be an All NBA defender too. Don't yeah, sleep that, on that. Defensively, he's really good. Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe. Defensively, he's really. He's good. going to be a more polished offensive version of Jimmy Butler. I don't like offensive. It. I know that's kind of mean. Jimmy Butler gets buckets. It's not me, even that. It's not even that. Jimmy, I don't think. I don't think Jimmy's a really good he passer. Is, and his offensive game is is past Jimmy's. No, I'm saying, but Jimmy's a really good passer. Yeah, but in that's terms what of, elevates in terms his of, offensive in game. In terms of driving, who's a better driver? Edwards. In terms of handling the ball, who who can get jiggy with it? It's Edwards. Edwards gives me VC vibes. Really? Mm-hmm. He literally gives me Vince Carter vibes. Like offensive. And Vince wasn't a good defender. Anthony Edwards, I think, is <coughs> Vince? he's motivated to be a great defender. And motivation is the first thing for yeah. a young player. I mean, yeah. he he said in, in five years, I want to be the face of the league. I mean, that's 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 hot because well, a lot of guys yo, in the league. He but, literally you know, gives me Vince Carter vibes offensively. Like, I don't know. I, think I just he think, can average 27, you know, I, I, 28 a that's game. That's the Ant Man, bro. We'll, we'll see. I like Ant, but yeah, we'll see about the cat thing and all you that. You know that they compare the side to side picture with Edwards and Michael Jordan? They look identical. Really? Yeah. What do, do you mean, like in terms in the face? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, bro. They actually look exactly the same. Oh, didn't really notice that. Yeah, we'll see. He's huh? already improved from year one to year two. Of course, John Moran's already improved. He's already a superstar. We got to see that year say? three leap from from Anthony. Yeah. Edwards like, what are you going to see? He's a superstar to the third seed in the West, bro. You can't say anything. Plus, I want to like if Minnesota, I, I believe they'll make it. I want to see how he fares in the yeah, playoffs. Like, I, John get, I get all the cat really love, but the, the cat didn't make the playoffs and be relevant until Jimmy Not Butler walked in. I'm, I'm just saying, about like, Anthony cat Edwards. didn't be relevant until Jimmy Butler walked in the door. I really see no. Relevant. I really see no reason why Edwards can't be the best shooting guard in the league. You look at all the shooting guards right now. Like, I I don't see any reason why he can't be better than all of those guys. Booker, Donovan. Maybe. Levine, Levine. Levine. I, why, come on, you gotta mention him. No, I'm just like I was just naming guys. Maybe. Levine's efficiency is out of this world. It's but unbelievable. How Edward, good he is. Edwards, I, I think he can get there. He can get there. <sighs> I still lean Levine. I lean all three of them. Oh like, yeah, right yeah, now, yeah, no, right, right yeah, now yeah. they're all better. But I'm saying sure. in the long, I, I love Levine's game. I love Levine's game. The pick aside fam is getting blessed this episode. There's a lot of hot takes. There are. There are. Yeah. Oh, that was just out of this world take. I think just because you're a Minnesota fandom, like you just love Minnesota. Nah, Edwards is just the man, bro. He's the Ant Man. I would tell you if it's crazy. It's not that crazy. Anthony Edwards is like that, bro. He's doing things in year two that Ja was not doing in year two. He made the playoffs. Ja, ja made the playoffs again. He was the ninth <laughs> seed and got in. He beat Steph. I'm gonna still, I'm gonna still give him credit for that. He averaged thirty and you're, you're in round sleeping one. on Jay Vando, bro. No, nah, Jay Vando's good. He's just a role player, though. But he's an exceptional he's a role player, bro. Bro, if, if if Anthony Edwards goes into the play in and he wins and he averages thirty in the playoff series, I swear to God, I will they give won't. You the nod. They, bro, they won't be in the play in. They'll be in the playoffs. Like I said, As I will give you the nod. I swear to God, if he if he can do it. My, by the way, Utah was the number one ranked defense last year, so I will give you the nod if he can do that. But John Morant literally averaged thirty on Utah. in a playoff series, not just a game, and he had a forty point game, bro. Mm-hmm. So please stop with the whole John didn't make year two adjustments, and then year three. He I didn't just, say he didn't make he, year. He didn't, I'm he, saying year three. He, he just took the I'm leap. I'm saying that Anthony Edwards has shown more strides in year two than yeah, John did. And you know, you're just looking. But at you're right. Stats. In the playoffs, he was yeah. awesome. I'm not just talking about stats. Again, they were the ninth seed. Who? The Grizzlies. Well, I mean, Minnesota. They beat the Spurs. Minnesota and they beat the was Warriors. just like the ninth seed, like last week, bro. They can end up being the ninth seed. They, they can end up being the great. Tenth. They've been playing great basketball of late. All right, I mean, recency bias. We'll see. We'll <laughs> the see. Clippers. I mean, that's what we're doing with John Moran. What do you mean? Recency bias. John Moran's been awesome. He was awesome last year. True. But Towards the end of the year, he's awesome. What are you talking about? And the Edwards was awesome down the end of the last season too. As a rookie, they sucked yeah. last year. They were terrible. So but he averaged well. twenty five in the second half of the season. He sucked. I don't care. Who? The 
Minnesota Timberwolves. No, I'm saying, but Edwards average twenty five. Oh no, but I, like I don't care. They sucked. <laughs> like, I, I don't care. Like it helps your argument. I get it. No, it's like why does it? Why are you telling me? I mean, me they that? suck because Cat was hurt. D'Lo was hurt. I mean, I mean, a lot of guys were hurt, bro. They were five hundred when all three of them played last year too. Five hundred flat. I just about. <laughs> just about. Okay. I mean, they're they're okay now. M- Memphis is nice, so we'll see. Memphis the, is really nice. Imagine I they agree. meet in the playoffs. Oof, that'd be lit. Who? Awesome. It wouldn't be lit. It'd be five games of ass yo, whipping. Yo, that, like, that, that, could, that could honestly, that you know, could honestly you know, happen. You know, <laughs> actually, yo, yo, you know. So I was actually, uh, I was going through our old, um, I think, podcast, and it was during the bubble when Utah was facing Denver, and you said something that was ridiculous. What else? You said that Rudy Gobert can take the Joker out the game. Oh yeah, we've already established yeah. that. You just wanted to bring that up. No, no, no. no I'm, Don't we? I mean, I, I told you I was watching some old clips, and you said that. That it, looks crazy now. I mean, because he's an MVP. It, it didn't look crazy because you, until said, you said it just now, and then nobody and, was thinking about it until you just and, brought and it and up. And then you said this. You were you were like, Jamal Murray can't win you a playoff series. You said that too, and he <laughs> went. He dropped two fifty balls after. Hey, that. prove me wrong. <laughs> I went yeah, back. I went back he and did. saw. I, I went back and saw an episode on the Bucks that we did back in the day. And you guys vouched for Giannis to stay, and I was telling him to to leave. And I was like, Chris Middleton can't be the second best player in a championship team. Like I was killing him, and now that ends up happening. And so. y'all just got to start riding with Middleton. It's that simple. I mean, you also had to take literally like that. You made like a couple months ago about that the you said the next third being third seed. And oh, that take all the sticks. Was horrible. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I, I, I don't. Bad, I don't, I don't think. Bad preseason. I'll be oh, honest. Yours I don't. Was awful. Easy. Yo, your, your Pacers take? No, the LeBron sixty five games. The Yo. Lakers. It's a Lakers. All right, Riv, that Lakers. was definitely a bad take. But I really don't think. That was worse than saying Gobert can neutralize Joker. I mean, one guy is the defensive player of the year. He's won it three times. He's actually a lot. No, I know that. But like the Joker won an MVP. He didn't win an MVP that year. I know. I know he didn't. But like, no. In hindsight, it looks bad. But at that moment, yeah. In hindsight, bust Gobert's ass. Not yet. He he was killing. He was killing him. Like bad. So there you go. And it went seven. So that you were very disrespectful to the Joker. They choked. It was all three one. I was like, Donovan this close. And like, Jamal yo, was Jamal was crazy. not about to win it, bro. I was literally this close to being right. And Mike then, Conley broke the game winner. Yeah, it was like so. I, it really the Jamal Murray thing was not that bad because they blew a three one lead, bro. But the Joker one, I'll give you that one. That was no. I remember Jamal Murray was unbelievable. No, but I'm saying they wasn't about to win. Is what I'm saying. Like uh, the Jazz uh, were up three one, and I was literally yo, this even, close to be like when the Jazz were up Clippers. Yeah, when the Jazz were up three one. When the Jazz were up three one, I was like, they should fire Mike Malone. Yeah, like he, he, yeah. He, he was yeah, like he it was. There. I was this close, bro. The Joker one was really. The reactions were crazy. The Clippers, no real reactions down three one. That's ridiculous, bro. The I Clippers made a trade with the Blazers, and I think it's safe to say that they pretty much fleeced them. They this looks really bad on Portland's part. The Clippers get Robert Covington, Norman Powell, and the Blazers get Eric Bledsoe, Justice Winslow, Keon Johnson, and a 2025 second round pick via Detroit. They traded Gary Trent Jr. for Norman Powell. And now they essentially traded Gary Trent Jr. for a second round pick. And Eric Bledsoe. And Eric Bledsoe, and Eric Bledsoe essentially. Bledsoe. Let's not forget that. Bye. Yeah. So <laughs> That's first, horrible. So first off, what, what, are your, <laughs> what are your first reactions to this deal? How do you feel about the Clippers now? How do you feel about the Blazers? I'll start with you, JC. Um, so as far as Portland, I mean, I do agree. I, I tweeted earlier, I think, you know, giving up Gary Trent for Norman Powell, I mean, Gary Trent's 23 years old. He fits Portland's, um, you know, timetable, but a move like that only tells me that Portland's invested in rebuilding. Now I wouldn't be surprised to see Jay McCullum or, and Damian Lillard are shipped out before the trade deadline. I mean, Chauncey Billups has said that he wants a whole new roster, a whole new, like different energy for his team and making a move like this, you know, it's it, it's it's trending towards the area that we've all felt Portland should have done years ago is rebuild. You know, you, you peaked when you made the Western Conference Finals with them. You had your chance when, Ke- yeah, when oh, Ke- yeah, 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 when Kevin Durant was out. You had your chance. You got no swept. Chance. That was the best chance that you had to make the finals. Um, but yeah, this this move for Portland for the Portland side of things. I mean, like I said, this just shows that they're committed to rebuilding. They got a young player in Keon in Keon Johnson. Keon right? Johnson and he's trash. Yeah, but he's gonna get more burn on Portland. Now, I just though. need you to know no, that. No, he's like, whack. Yeah, he's trash. But um, he's just bouncing. You know, as far as, like you know, as far as this, I mean, CJ is gonna be out the door soon, and I think Damian Lillard is gonna be out the door soon. So this this move just shows me that it's Portland's preparing for a full rebuild. And as far as the Clippers, I mean, 
I think that this is a good move for the Clippers. I mean, Norman Powell, he's more of a win-now player as well. I mean, he didn't fit Portland's timetable because, you know, he's a player that you you plug in now and he can produce for you. Um, you're going to get Kawhi Leonard back next year fully healthy. You're going to get Paul George back next year fully healthy. And my take as the days go on of saying their championship <laughs> window was closed – after that move kind of looks really bad on my part but you know what i'm not gonna back down of it i'm not gonna, i'm not gonna think i don't think that they have to show me i'm yep. use the river they have to show me show you <laughs> yes they show me but you know i mean this clippers team is, is looking scary and i mean I, f I see like a lot of people gassing up like robert covington and this and Roku. that yeah roco uh he's not what he used to be in minnesota or even his small tent uh stint in houston as a shooter or even as a defender because he was a better defender there than he was in portland so uh, you're not really going to be getting much. I think you have rotational guys like Marcus Morris and all these other guys that are just better than him. Nick Batum are offered more, but he adds depth to their team. And, you know, this is a team that's going to get back two of their best players. Reggie Jackson is going to be there and they're all on the contract for a while. So I think, I think this move uh, favors the Clippers now, obviously, because they think that they still have a chance to win a title. And then this move just shows me that Portland is really close to being committed to a full rebuild, in which I think that they should have done three years ago. And I wouldn't be surprised if Dame and CJ are out the door next. Or, and Nurkic as well. He's another one that's got to go, too. If, you know, if they want to commit to a full rebuild, I think he's got to go, too. They got to get those Greg Brown minutes in. Can I go? I'm, oh, I'm, sure, I'm really sure. excited. Sure, go ahead, man. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> you know... <sighs> If this is the start of their real build, it's horrible. First of all, I could not. Explore. First of all, Eric Bledsoe is very, very not good. And I remember he's not going to stay. No, he's but hold on, he's, no, he's mid. Because we're mid. throwing out bad takes. I remember you. I remember you. Oh, Eric Bledsoe is just as good as Pat Beth. Yeah, that take stinks. That was a bad take. <laughs> Number two, I didn't say you, that. Oh, no, I didn't. Yo, bro. you're. Cr I didn't it doesn't say even. That. You know what? It doesn't even yeah, matter. I'll be lying. Bro. Stand on it. Yeah, I respect that. This move for me. Just Wait for the Clippers or Portland. Clippers. This this Clippers move. Well, Portland, if this was the start of the real build, it's really bad because they really didn't get any. I mean, Keon, he's not that good, but, you know, he's young. Well, whatever. Yeah, but you got to look at it from the aspect of the Dame and CJ. They're going to attract and get a lot more. And Nurkic, they're going to get a lot for that. Yeah, so that's, you absolutely. Know? But, you know, I feel like they could have got a second. <coughs> you could have got a pick They did get something. a second round pick. Yeah, so, all right, so boom. For the Clippers, this, for me, like, this is a good move for me. Like, this is great. You just build on the depth you already had. The Clippers healthy was already a deep team. Now you're just adding on to that depth. And for me, like this team was already fighting. I think they're eighth seed right now. They're like a half game or a game behind Minnesota. This just pushes me further. They're, they're going to they're gonna get in. Not the playoffs. Like I ain't going fully sold on that. But they're a playing team for sure. This is going to help them. Norman Powell's a good three-point shooter, good defender when he wants to be. I feel like now being in the Clippers, playing around these type of guys, playing under Ty Lue, it gives you more motivated. Roku, cool. he may not be a lockdown man-to-man, -man, but he can still be a help side defender. So really good still, one. He can still be somebody who is off-ball, can be a good defender. And maybe he can find his jump shot again, you know? So, like I said, guys under Ty Lue, Reggie Jackson, he rebirthed his career under Ty Lowe. He's a goal. No, I love Reggie. He's a no, goal, bro. Reggie. He's mad good. He, Bobby Schmurder, I love him. He he, he rebuilt his career. He shoots 39% from the field. Okay. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> he rebuilt his career. You know, Luke Kennard has seemed to find a home in L.A. under Ty Lowe. So, you know, for me, this is just a good move. What for about Amir Coffee? Something about Amir Coffee. He's better than Robert Covington. I well, stand that's, on that's that. just take. No, that's I'm such saying, a weird comparison. No, you're right though. I did say Bledsoe was better than Pat. I know you did. Know. Anyways, <laughs> um, like I know you did. Like you tried to. I know you did. No, I just checked the messages right now. Y'all yeah. just be lying. <laughs> no, y'all do be lying. You you was trying to <laughs> lie on me. I admit you it. You lied on me. I admitted it. Yeah, I, you I did try. You, you lied on him, but you tried to blatantly Twitter lie on him. Like it was crazy. That's why I had to come out and say I made a mistake. You was trying to twist. Twitter, Twitter posed me, bro. Yep. Well, because you agreed, and that's what I locked in on. But then you said, nah, that's not what happened. Nah, tweets like you said, though, me. getting Paul George and Kawhi back would be huge because this team mean? is deep. So, tweets know. pose Chip? me. Chips, maybe. <sighs> I just, I don't want my take to look bad, so I don't want hey, to. Hey, man, stand on it. No, I'm going to stand well, on it. I'll tell it, you but, what. You know? They're saying this season, Paul George, they're not they're, coming back this year. No, they, Paul they came George is unlikely. He's getting an MRI in three weeks, but it's probably doubtful he'll come back. But he's, he's his next MRI so is in three weeks. Here's a, here's a silver lining for Portland, right? They traded Powell because he was going to begin upwards of $20 million a season. Now, Powell has been trending in the right direction, no doubt, in his offensive game. For years. No doubt, for sure. Excuse me. But I'm, I'm under, the uh, under the impression that Portland's real realizing a rebuild is coming sooner rather than later, and they don't want to have that contract on their... And Bledsoe's on a one-year deal. On their cap, which makes sense. There you go. Now... For from the outside looking in, yes, the Clippers got a steal. 
they had to give up very minimal to get this player that is very solid, can average almost 20 points per game. He's a really good scorer. But for Portland, it doesn't matter for them. They're just trying to get this cap off. They're trying to free up space. They're trying to get as much capital as they can, and this was just the start of it. What what really could you have gotten for Powell more than this? I feel like if you would have gotten more for Powell, they would have done it. I feel like for a team that has made it their their motive to try to keep Dame home and made it their motive to try to show him just from what they've this all season was a slap yeah, in the just face, like to try to show him that they're committed to his aspirations to win a championship. This all the moves they've made slap have been just face. disrespectful. Listen, one of the things I did say in the off season was I did believe Portland was not going to play well, well and it was going too. to That's inevitably be the beginning of the end for Dame and his time with the Blazers. Now Norman Powell was the first move of that sorts. Now potentially. I think Dame's moved in the offseason. I don't think he's moved before the trade deadline. Because he's hurt right now. Yeah, but even still, I think a team would trade for him. It's an, it's an abdominal injury. He got surgery. They said that he could be re- reevaluated from the time of the injury that had occurred f- f- up to five weeks. Like, that's as soon as it could be. And it's an They'll injury. probably shut him down. I don't, well, the, talking about? given Dame. the fact that the, okay. the, and Simmons the Blazers... Probably, they're probably going to let Simmons run the one for the year. They'll probably Where shut would him Dame down. go, though? Where could he trade him to? I mean, there's probably a couple options, but CJ crazy. has to go. I mean, they have to trade him within the next five days. Pels. He's gonna, he's gone. He's going to be gone. I think the Pelicans is an awful because the, one, the Pelicans are desperate for guard depth, but also they, they've reportedly they're shopping Josh Hart. If I'm the Blazers and I can get Josh Hart and some picks back, I'm not totally opposed. He's been Josh Hart is always a, getting traded to rebuild. <laughs> he's been impressive this season. Yeah, he's a good player. Yeah, and he, I think he yeah. fits with Chauncey once. He, no, he fits perfectly with Chauncey. So I, I think it makes sense. He gets a lot of and rebounds, it's like so. Simons has been playing very well this is season. It Simmons too, or Simons? It's Simons. It's Simons. That's another reason why they probably yeah, felt confident in year. letting Powell go. He's a young piece that they can just pay very minimal. Should have kept trying. This this obviously looks bad on the Blazers because. Of what they said in the offseason about trying to surround Dame. But let's be clear. Let's just be brutally honest. You can say as much as you want to say. Your actions speak more than your words. No doubt. The Blazers' actions right now are showing that they're rebuilding. They're not trying to compete. And this trade, if we are under the assumption that they are not trying to compete, is not a bad trade. You got a young player in Keon Johnson who... (laughs) You you say he's not a good player. I don't disagree with you. I would say he's a raw player. Very raw. I mean, two years ago, we were saying Nazir Little wasn't good, and now look at what Chauncey's done with him. You know, Keon Johnson, if he gets minutes, can he play better? Maybe. Justice Winslow now has a chance to get minutes and showcase himself a little bit. You said Justice Winslow? I feel like there's still <laughs> something there. I'll be honest. I really do think there's still something there. This was a rebuilding move. Now the Blazers have more young players in Anthony Simons, Nazir Little, who's out for the year, Keon Johnson, Greg Brown. You could fit Justice Winslow into there. And now if they, if they get Josh Hart back, you know, this isn't looking horrible. <laughs> that team this, is garbage. No, nah, no, this, this, this <laughs> they're gonna isn't going to get more of the crazy. stuff for Dame, CJ, and Nurkic. That's where they're going to get the a hope big so, portion bro. of. They are. They are. Dame's going to get I a mean, lot of I mean, you have to think about it. If, if CJ goes to the Pelicans and they, they get Josh Hart back in, the yep. Pelicans would have to give up a first round pick. If mm-hmm. that first round pick is this first round pick, mm-hmm. the Pelicans are going to be bad. How yeah. many firsts is CJ worth? Two. One. One. At one. Most. one at most. I would probably one in a player. That's it. Yeah. Wait, CJ gets paid north of 25, bro. A player isn't going to cut it. I mean, they'll probably have to trade somebody else. I was thinking two firsts as well. I don't. I don't, I don't think, think Pelicans aren't giving up. This you think CJ pick. still has something left in the tank as a player? Yeah. Yeah, right? I mean, you never know that because the Pelicans might say, you know what? Zion, Ingram, CJ. You think the Mavs would be good suited? teams? Be okay. Mavs. Devontae Graham. Maybe they could even trade Devontae Graham for CJ. They're that, similar that players. Devontae, Josh Hart, boom, pick, bow. What'd you say? Mavs. For CJ? Mm-hmm. That'd be pretty cool. I don't I don't know why Dallas would do that. Why? <laughs> why do you act like that? Just he, just, he, know doesn't, why. he doesn't help what they want to do. I, I just... Uh, I think the... Uh, <laughs> I can't deny Brunson, adding offense. Brunson so is not as good as McCullum, but he's I know, that's how it him. comes off, that I seem mad. But I've been just, telling you guys this, and I told you guys this I last know, time. you want them to get a wing. Yes, I don't feel like a guard, a 6'2 guard for, solves their problem. But it's like, he's what's wrong, with, what's wrong, with, six, three, what's wrong with guard depth? Like, I agree, Jalen Brunson's very good depth for the guards. They're going to have to pay Brunson. Brunson might walk. I just don't. It's like that's another. I, depth I, that I don't. I'm not a big. Plus, Tim Hardaway's been horrible this year too. 
He's been horrible. Let me talk about the Clippers real, real quick. Okay. Norman Powell is the highlight of this deal. I mean, he signed through 25-26, the 25-26 season. He's going to be here for a while. Mm -hmm. I love Steve Ballmer's aggressiveness. He wants to win, and it shows. It, it really does show. Oh, here it comes. The Clippers players locked up for next season, PG, Kawhi, Morris, Kennard, Reggie, Zubats, Mann, Batum has a player option, Brandon Boston, Norman Powell. Robert Covington won't be on the team next year. I am. That's just the truth. He won't be on the team. But if he balls, you don't think they bring him back? What's well, ball? <laughs> like, I don't know. He plays better know. than than how he's. I don't know playing. if he'll ball or not. Mm -hmm. But this team is this team is a championship level team. It is, and I don't even think I mentioned Ibaka. He might be a free agent. He might come back. I'm not sure. But free agent. this team is a championship level team. Norman Powell, 18 point per game score. I think this raises their ceiling for this season. Now that PG and Kawhi aren't coming back. Now, what you said about them being a six seed, maybe that's not too far-fetched now. Tyron Lue has been a, a great coach this year. Norman Powell is, is a proven scorer and a proven defender. This fits what they want to do. I think if the Blazers are rebuilding, this fits what they want to do. Billups has said, interim Blazers general manager Joe Cronin and I have so many talks and conversations about NBA championship contending team roster looks like and trying to find a way to get our roster to that point, Billups said. Today, we lost some good players, obviously, that were really loved around here, but this is all a part of it. This is, kind of, this is the kind of business of it that we took some necessary steps to have the flexibility we're going to need. Bledsoe kind of fits what Billups wants, too. That's the funny part. He's and not going to be there long term. Though. That's just hilarious. I do think they should go into a full rebuild. And I know what you were what you were thinking I was preparing to say. Yeah. Maybe I should say it. <laughs> say because, it, please. No, because say it. it's fact. I want you to say Here it. Here we go. The Clippers are a better organization than the Lakers. They're more They're more well run. I don't care Just about of recent. Can you say of recent? I don't care. I don't care about the championships the Lakers have. I know people are going to say, but you have to take that into account. They won with Kobe 2010 and 2009. When Kobe is last season with the Lakers and even basically the, the, the back end of his career, the Lakers weren't making the playoffs. If it wasn't for LeBron joining the Lakers, they would have been going on nine years of missing the playoffs. These past 10 years, I could say the Lakers have been just as bad as the Knicks in terms of movements and running an organization. They have been. I think that all goes oh. out the window just because they have a ring. And oh, no, the Clippers, also, the, Clipper, the Clippers, Clippers, the Clippers made their first Western Conference the, the Clippers, finals in their history. The Clippers, last season. That's a fact. Okay. The Clippers in the last 10 seasons have more 50 win seasons than the Lakers. They have been, I mean, you look at the culture they're building. They're building a new arena. Ballmer wants his own place now. He's investing into the team. Even when they lost Chris Paul and Blake Griffin, Doc Rivers got a team with role players to the playoffs. And took the Warriors to six. Got a point. He's saying organization. Are you just saying of recent? Has to of be. course oh, yeah. it's There's a recent. There's no way he's talking I mean, about I, back in the I mean, day. I mean, look. I know. I know. That's I, I, why I, mean, look, I don't care about I mean, the championships. I mean, That's be, when because, I'm just like, Because right, this is, this this is, is why. This is why. The person that built the Lakers back in the 2000s was Jerry West. Rob Palink is in charge now. This current Lakers organization is not what it once was with Jim Buss and Jerry West. It's Genie Buss now. It's Rob Palinka now. As a point. And they are dysfunctional. The 2020 LeBron, team was well built, though. Regardless of whether you want to say it was LeBron coming in and changing it. That wasn't sure. a super LeBron, team either. That LeBron, wasn't a super team. Listen, Le, LeBron, his first year in L.A., misses the playoffs. I understand. Due to injury. I understand yeah, that. That's big. The second season, that championship is the only thing people can hold on to. And a championship ring... Is a very big deal. I'm not knocking it. But that to me is speaking more of the power of LeBron James yep. than the Lakers being able to run a well run organization. LeBron James brought the city of Cleveland its first championship in history. And we know historically they have not been a well run organization. The Lakers have the history over the Clippers. But if you're telling me which organization is going to win more, be more successful, make better moves, Clippers or Lakers, I'm going with the Clippers. I don't think it's even close in terms of just functionality. The Lakers are dysfunctional. 
I will say this. The 2020 team that was built by Rob Palenka was a very solid. You said 2012? 2020. Okay. Was a very solid team. Of course, LeBron's on the squad. Anthony Davis pulling that trade off. It was a great trade regardless of what you want to say. Pulling the trade off? Getting that trade done. Getting Anthony Davis in conference. Anthony no Davis one thought came that he out gonna, and said he wants to go to LA. He was going to end up in LA regardless, but trading yeah, for him, getting him before... You know what I'm saying? They did what they wanted to do. Yeah, they, they got, got a in the offseason. Yeah, I don't think it was they that They got a ring. Did. No, of course, but it, I'm, I'm pretty sure Anthony Davis would, would have been under contract one more season, mm-hmm. and then we would have gotten him in that next offseason. How, yeah. how well built was that team? I mean, KCP was great. Caruso was a solid piece who we've seen now him leave. He's been great. Dwight Howard was Dwight good. Howard was awesome. Rajon Rondo was awesome. These guys all played spectacular, and then come playoff JaVale. time, JaVale, all McGee. Those players, JaVale McGee was great as well. All those players you're mentioning were all the players. Danny Green was awesome as well. All the players you're mentioning are the players that every single <laughs> person, every Lakers Danny fan. Danny Green was pretty great all let season me finish, defensively. Let me finish. All the players you're mentioning are the players that people who have pointed fingers at saying they suck. <laughs> that were on the team last year. This last year when they lost Phoenix in the first I round. I never have spoken. Uh, I'm, I'm a Lakers fan here. I'm not so talking about you. I know. Okay, I know. But you, I know what you, you mean. Talk, you talk about your Lakers fan. Look, you're a LeBron fan. Let's just keep it a <laughs> Why are you doing that to me? <laughs> because it's a fact, bro. I, I'm just saying. Since LeBron's been on the team. All right. So regardless you want to say, last season, I, he was a part of the team. I was a fan. I never, never spoke He's ill speaking of K- in general, KCP. Though. Okay, fine. The only way he spoke bad about really was Kuzma. Talk, he wasn't no, but, he's, but he's talking about in general, like in, like the fan base. Yeah, has I get said it. I get so. it. Rondo was on a team last year. No, and that's what I'm saying. Rondo, but he's regressed, and, and it's 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 evident. I mean, who's I mean, Schroeder was is better than Rondo. He was Rondo last season. You're saying Schroeder yeah. was because this season he's he's been mid too. He's been hot and cold and mostly cold. Schroeder was torched last year. Yeah, I was torched. <laughs> I mean, has were we wrong about Schroeder? Kuzma was towards Kuzma you was love- the one I was wrong on. That was it. I love Caruso. I said I miss him dearly. KCP, his defense and his ability to sp- his ability to space the floor, he will be missed. But wasn't your it problem against Phoenix was the fact that you guys had a lack of offense? It was no AD. Oh, okay. okay. It doesn't look. I'll say this. It, it. I am not looking into that championship too much, because- even though that team was pretty solid. That team was very I solid. look at LeBron and I'm like, okay, he's the reason it all happened. And you're talking to me, who I would love to listen. It sounds great. I mean, the reason the Lakers that team was the, awesome. The reason the Lakers got AD was because LeBron wanted. See, him. that's you just call me a LeBron fan trying to like debunk me being a Lakers fan. But I'm just saying, if that was the case, I'd really be on your side, saying no doubt about it. LeBron basically did this by himself. What have that's the what Lakers? What have the Lakers you're, done I'm, in terms listen, of moves? And, and that's. You're not wrong. You talk, no, I'm not hold, disagreeing. Hold, hold, hold. I'm just telling you, you talk, that 2020 you talk, team was well put you talk, together. Excuse you, me. you talk about just getting AD. KCP was already on the roster. LeBron, uh, yeah. did, they didn't have to trade for him. I know. I mean, who put that together? I mean, signing Ronda, was that that big of a signing? Getting Howard, getting JaVale. Caruso was already on the roster too, I believe. Howard All these JaVale players that big. were... But that Caruso were, was, was like a... Caruso was a on the roster guy, too. And he just came up and he was awesome. I mean, yeah, but it, it's not like... Rob Palenka was going out and saying, okay, we need a piece to get over the hump. We got to trade for one. Brought in and Dan- building that roster. Brought, he didn't build up that brought, roster. Brought, brought in Danny he Gre- just traded for AD. Brought in Danny Green. Rajon Rondo, I believe, was on the team the he year before. He brought in Danny Green who got death threats. Because yeah, he shot bad, but he played well defensively. Bro got death threats. He was trending on okay, Twitter again, every that, day. That, yes, because yeah, he didn't mo- shoot he well. Because it's, it's an offensive league. It really is. If you don't play well, I understand, that's what but I'm not. Bashed. I'm not. I am not crediting Rob Palenka for that or the Lakers organization. I'm crediting. I'm giving him a little bit of I'm, credit. I'm you crediting. Put it together. I'm, I'm crediting LeBron going to LA, saying, that's a huge "I want to live here. I want AD. Do whatever you got to do to trade for him. I'll figure the rest out." Because that's what LeBron has been. That's why his last year in Cleveland was awful because he did exactly that. I trade all these players. And now we suck. And last now, year was awful in, in Cleveland? Cleveland. They went to the finals. That roster was garbage. Yeah, but they still went to the finals. Okay, but that that because that's LeBron. But that roster, no, that roster was, was pretty that garbage. roster was, was garbage. Terrible. The and worst that, team he's ever had. And that roster was garbage because Kyrie wanted to leave LeBron. Because I mean, they were trying, they were scrambling for trades to make. Right now, we're looking at the same thing happening with the Lakers. This roster sucks. They try to get a quick fist and Russ. I don't think they're going to make the championship this year. We gotta get healthy before I give you my. Full you're healthy analysis. tonight. 
They're all LeBron's back. I'm hyped. Yeah. I'm excited. Yo, bro. You got it. LeBron stay. is back. It's my squad. Like, what do you want me to do? Yeah. I no, you to be, suck. I no, you to not be realistic. Do that. I'll, when they lose, they lose. I'll tell you, it was a bad season, but it's not going to happen. It is a bad not, season at the moment. Sure. We've been unhealthy. It's unfortunate. I've been that good when you were healthy. Too. So last week we talked about James Harden and potentially leaving Brooklyn. The Nets said they're not open to trading him, but now they are open to trading him in. One bad game. Let's get him off the team. And Philly has, emer- has emerged as oh. a team they're going to communicate with. Let's act. Let's just pretend in this in this fairy tale world that a trade gets done before the deadline. Harden is in Philly with Embiid. Simmons, who we know is going to be the main piece in the deal, is in Brooklyn with Kyrie and KD. Which team has the better chance to win a championship? It depends on health. I think you got to look at Philly. I mean, you got to look at Philly. You got to look at the fact that Embiid has been at a ridiculous MVP level. You got to look at Tyrese Maxey. He's definitely ascending into one of those emerging uh, guards in the league. Matisse Diable, he's a lockdown. You know what he's going to Tobias oh, yeah. Harris, he's a steady. He's, he's been pretty steady for them. So you got to look at that team. And you look at Doc Rivers. You know, he's made some adjustments in his coaching. And he's got this team playing as well as they've been playing. So it's like with, with Brooklyn, it's just too many, you know, ifs. If Kyrie was vaccinated, if KD stays fully healthy, when you? are we going to see Joe Harris play again? You know, what Ben Simmons are we going to get? You know, and I get it. The same thing could be said about Harden. Like Harden in Philly, that's a tough environment to play in. You know, that's a very, very, very stressful environment. Can Harden survive that? But I think playing with Embiid, a big man as talented as Embiid has been, Harden's never had that type of big man talent. So I think that's something in itself that can be a new dynamic in Brooklyn. Now you're looking at Ben Simmons. What Ben Simmons are we going to get? Is he going to shoot more? Is he going to take more layups? Is he going to be more aggressive? Is he going to be unplayable in certain fourth quarters because his offense isn't that good? We know the defense is going to be there. We know the rebound is going to be there. But what about on offense? It's like, like you said, it's an offensive league. Definitely. What, what is going to happen on offense? And Kyrie, he's a part-timer. I don't think Kevin Durant and Ben Simmons, a duo like that, is enough. Uh, it's, it's really just not. I think Kyrie being a part-timer really puts them in a tough situation where now you have to go get somebody that's not maybe not match his offense, but somebody that's going to give you that. And Ben Simmons doesn't really give you that. So for me, it's Philly because I think like Embiid and KD, they've been at MVP levels, but I feel like Harden being in a new environment, playing with a big, that elite, that just opens up his game a little bit more. And Ben Simmons, he's just too limited as of what we've seen Mm -hmm. for me to say, you know, the Nets. So I would probably say Philly. You get Harden. It's a very, very complete team in Philly. Seth Curry has been solid in his role. Tobias Harris has been a very consistent ball player. Joel Embiid is the MVP of the league right now. You add James Harden to this mix, who I didn't even mention, excuse me, as you already mentioned, Tyrese Maxey, who's taking unbelievable strides, and Philadelphia has already said that they will not include Tyrese Maxey in any deal because they believe that just trading Ben is enough. A superstar for superstar trade. Which is ridiculous. (laughs) You're not wrong. Superstar, superstar um, trade is crazy. That's what the, that's their words. Um, they believe that that would be enough. Uh, I just do believe. I see it with like this. You hit it right in the nose. He's never played with a big man like this, and I compare it to when Anthony Davis and LeBron teamed up, where LeBron never had a pick and roll type of caliber player until he played with Anthony Davis. The connection was immediate. The, the success was immediate. Now you have James Harden who'd be able to run a similar type of pick-and-roll, pick-and-pop offense with Joel Embiid who has these unbelievable post abilities. You can do whatever you want in that offense. And then that's when the spacing just gets crazy. It does depend on James's offense, though. James Harden, excuse me. I don't look at the Nets and, and, and say that they would be... the in a better situation because their depth right now does concern me. And the health of Kevin Durant does concern me. I think come playoff time, the Nets will take the hit and they'll pay the fine for Kyrie to play home games. There's a stipulation that they could do that. They just have to pay a fine. I do believe that if it comes down to it, they, should. they this is their championship window slowly, but surely is closing. As long as you have Kevin Durant, you're going to be in conversations, but the, how long can you rely on Kevin Durant to be healthy? I think if I'm Philadelphia, I understand that this roster I have is very, very good, and I have some decent depth on this roster. I add James Harden to this where I can get Joel Embiid better looks, 
and I can bring in an offensive player of such high regard in James Harden, I'm looking my chops. The Nets are in better position. It's as simple as that. And with Ben Simmons coming in, I know he's been ragged on a lot. People laugh at him. And they don't they they I think Ben Simmons has gotten to this point underrated for what he brings to a team. You don't have to tell me, brother. Ben Simmons is locked up for the next couple of years. If the Nets get him, they understand we're gonna have KD here. We're gonna have Simmons here. Kyrie resigns back because he wants to play with KD. They now got a group of guys locked in, committed to the team. Ben Simmons doesn't have to be the savior for the Nets. In Philly, most of this most of his criticism in the playoffs stems from his lack of aggressiveness. In Brooklyn, you don't need to be anything more than an elite defender and facilitate at times. That's it. I look at a small lineup of that they can run with of Kyrie and Mills and Harris and KD and Simmons. And I'm like, the spacing in that lineup, Simmons can have a field day. When you have two players like Kyrie and KD who can drop 30 on any single given night, who have both averaged 30 in the playoffs before on excellent efficiency, I don't need 15 from Ben. Ben can give me 10. Ben can give me 8. Just play great defense and we'll be fine. It's not going to be just Ben. It's going to be Ben and maybe Thibel goes or Korkmaz goes or Niang, one of these other players and maybe some picks. It's not going to be just Ben. The Nets wouldn't do that. And if Philly wants to take the risk and try to wait for Harden to get there in the offseason, good luck. They don't have cap space right now. They're going to have to trade Ben Simmons regardless. Tobias Harris is a big cap casualty. And if they trade those guys, now you got to get players whose cap, who, whose contract aren't, overly expensive so you can sign James Harden if he becomes a free agent. So it's much more trickier. I look at Philly and you're right. It it doesn't sound like a bad roster. Harden, Seth Curry, Danny Green, Tobias Harris, Joel Embiid. That's a great roster. Off the bench, Korkmaz, Milton, Niang, Drummond, Maxi. still. I think Doc Rivers is a better coach than Steve Nash. If Thibel is moved, who is their defender? Who is their defender on the... Who, if the Nets and Sixers get into a series and they don't have a Thibel, they don't have Simmons, who's guarding Kyrie? Oh, Harden's going to go... Oh, Danny Green? Danny Green becomes their best perimeter defender. Good luck against KD and Kyrie. Good luck. You think they would move Thibel before they move Curry? I had a similar thought. If they move Curry, I don't think I'm they ecstatic. Move Curry, if, if I'm Brooklyn, if they and I get Curry, I'm ecstatic. What I was, no, no, I'm just asking from Philly's perspective, knowing that Ben's gone. Okay, you think this is what I'm saying. If if they don't if they don't move Thibel and keep Curry, you now remove a 40 plus percent three point shooter on your roster, and now mm-hmm. your starting lineup is probably Danny Green, Thibel, Harden, Tobias, and Embiid. You can ca- game plan for that much easier. Maxi than you isn't can. a starter. No, I think if Harden goes there, he's off the he's coming off the bench. But you're saying you'd have Thibel in the starting rotation? You need a lockdown defender. You need a perimeter defender in the mm-hmm. in the starting rotation. I feel like they'd be more willing to give up draft capital. I feel like they still have a I think, I, I, think the, I think the Nets knowing they need some depth are going to ask for a couple of players other than Ben. One or two, and they're going to be impactful players. Hey man, Ben and Tobias for Joe Harris and Harden works. The the edge Mark, you can go. <laughs> the edge the Sixers have is Joel Embiid because the Nets don't have a center. That's really it. But Philadelphia's offense is going to be so much more different if Harden goes there. They now become a heavy pick-and-roll team. Yep. Right now, they're currently 26 in pick-and-roll man frequency. That would have to go up to number one in the league with James Harden. They're currently 19th in isolation. Harden on every team he's been on has been first. In isolation, that changes. They're currently first in post-up frequency with Joel Embiid, rightfully so. Definitely. If Harden is there with his increased isolations that now puts them in the top five of the league because that's how much he demands, he's that great of a player, but now their enhanced pick-and-roll man frequency, you don't get the same post touches for Embiid. And that's where they've been thrown. I really, I think that 
I think that Embiid, the pick and roll, him having Harden as a pick and roll partner would be awesome. It would be amazing. I think Embiid, he wants the ball. He, He'll get it. Yeah, so you don't I, but, think you don't think they're they're like you think their first and post up. You think that's gonna drop all like far enough for where Embiid is not gonna I, get. I touches? do think I do think it is, and this is the thing: not all big men want to be role men. They want to catch the ball on a block, and they want to go do the work themselves. The reason Dwight Howard left Houston and Harden and him have beef was because Harden said, "I just want to run pick and roll," and Dwight said, "I'm trying to get some post touches." Yeah, I get that, but Embiid is at that not point. Dwight. At that, I know. At that point, James Harden had every right to demand that because he was by far the better player. But going into Philly, is he going to take that much of a backseat to Embiid? He probably will because he probably understands Embiid is probably the better player right now. He's done it with KD. I feel like he can do it again. But now we're looking at we're not getting the same Harden. And that's my concern with Philly. Their offense drastically changes. For with Brooklyn, we know they're a heavy ISO team, regardless if Harden's there or not. Definitely. KD, Kyrie, they're going to do their thing. Ben Simmons can seamlessly fit there, won't have the pressure of a big, gigantic market, and he can just play a role and be at ease playing that role. And the Nets need defenders. I want to ask. No, go ahead, go ahead. What, what, what's, because you said, you said something that I thought about. You said when Philly, when he, Ben Simmons was playing with Philly last year in the playoffs, he had a certain amount of responsibilities. What, I, I don't think, like, if he goes to Brooklyn, I don't think his responsibilities decrease or increase. It's pretty simple. If you have a mismatch, take it. If you're wide open for a layup, take the layup. I think it's going to be similar in Philly. Like you're talking about how he can seamlessly work into that role. He's still going to be a guard. Like it's it, the question, I guess the same question that you have for Harden is the same for Ben Simmons. If he goes to Brooklyn, is he going to be a guy where, Oh, we don't need to guard him. Cause he can't, he does not going to take the shot. Is he going to be a guy of offense where it's like, yo, he is. It, how is the spacing drastically going to change? If this is a guy we don't need to guard, you said the spacing is going to be great. How, how can it really be great though? If, I'm guarding Ben Simmons, and I know he's not going to take that shot, so nobody has to really help me. If you, you know what I'm if you have Harris, Mills, KD, Kyrie, but if you all don't have 40% three-point shooters, there's going to be spacing now. No, but I'm saying if Ben has the ball, where's the spacing coming from? Because you well, don't have why, to help. Why, why does Ben just have to have the ball at the top of the key? Well, even if, even if— Why can't he catch the ball on the block? When, when has he—he he doesn't do that a lot, though, bro. But why can't he? But th that's but that goes back to the same thing I'm saying. See, you're see, assuming. I feel like you're no. You're assuming that the only scenario Ben Tim is going to have the ball is at the top of the key. No, 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 where no, no. I'm saying defenses like, can. What I'm saying that's what history off. has shown. What I'm saying I'm, is, what, I understand what. It's, what but it's not. That's but, not no, what, what I'm saying is the same. How you have so many questions for Harden, you was so quick to say Ben can easily do this when the history has shown us he has been more problematic in changing his game, bro. It's it's the same thing. So the same you 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 went in and you said mm -mm. Harden has this. Mm -mm. It's, there's certain things I don't know. It's hard for me to because he won't do this. But Ben Simmons, what he's shown us, not just in the regular season, but in the playoffs, is what we what we've seen, and that, that's why I, that's the question. Why I'm Simmons asking the question. hasn't had a problem changing his game. He's figure? had a problem elevating it. That's a difference. Uh, his critique in that. Philly comes from his lack of elevation in lack the playoffs. Of in Brooklyn, I don't need you to be an all-star. I don't need you to be number one overall pick, Ben Simmons. I just need you to guard the opposing team's best player, roll hard to the basket, and take advantage of mismatches. When, but that, and and back that's to my it. point, when has he ever taken advantage of mismatches when it mattered? He hasn't. The history has shown he hasn't done that. So I'll tell you what. He hasn't. I'll tell you what. My faith, oh, it's faith. Right. in That's Brooklyn is not predicated on what I have seen or not seen from Ben Simmons. My faith in Brooklyn is that they have Kevin Durant. They have Kyrie Irving. The rest will figure itself out if they okay. get Ben and they get complimentary players around them. <laughs> Then you can say the same thing With about James, James Harden. Harden. That's such a fact. Yeah, you literally just contradicted yourself. No, I no, no. I, I mean, with James Harden on the Nets, like why, like 
why would you get rid of Ben, who there's questions on his game when you have James Harden, who I guess still has questions on his game, on his game, excuse me, but is still a better offensive player. Wait, ask that question again. Yeah. So, yeah. I so I my point is, you're saying how it's Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, the rest will figure itself out, right? Why remove James Harden from that equation then? Because he wants to get traded. He, does he want to get traded? Yes. He I mean, wants, like, it's clear as day, he wants I mean, to be moved. He, there's a report that he's disgruntled with the Nets organization. If he had wanted to stay, he would have signed his extension. That's just a fact, bro. I mean, Anthony Davis waited to sign his extension, Kyrie didn't too. sign his extension either. I mean, he has a player option. But he didn't, they, he didn't, they both do. I am much more confident in Kyrie staying because of his friendship with Kevin Durant than I am with James Do you Harden. think the Nets have a better chance to win a championship with James Harden or Ben Simmons? Ooh. That's the that's what I'm saying. Ooh. This I am not looking at it from the lens that they're only getting Simmons because that's not going to happen. They're going to get Simmons and a cork mox but that's the or report. Simmons. It's it's not no. The report has never been it's a clean swap. No, that that Philly the Nets, feels as if can, they but don't. But the Nets are not the, the Nets are not going to accept a clean swap for Harden but and we Simmons. Can't, Come we, on, let's get real. We can't make the assumption because we don't know who will be I in the swap. But we know picks. those two guys are going to go. We just don't the know Nets, the other guys. The Nets don't care about picks. They just traded a shit ton of their picks to go get Harden to win now. They don't care about that. I mean, they Harden want is a Harden. Pl- they want a player. If you get if you're telling me I'm getting Simmons, Corkmaz, and or or in a Shake Milton or Simmons, Thibel in a Milton, yeah. I think that helps the Nets tremendously. For the Nets, for their roster, I'd much rather want that depth than just Harden, given what we've seen from them this season. But either way, they can win a championship with both. Like I, it's KD and Kyrie. If they're healthy, they can beat anybody. KD and Kyrie were better against Milwaukee than when Harden came back. And I know that Harden was injured, but KD and Kyrie alone could have beat Milwaukee wait, if wait, Kyrie wait. stayed healthy. But, but th- th- this year... Katie and Kyrie, oh, with that depth, can beat anybody. K- Katie and Kyrie, that's what you're telling me. This year. Why not? If they, but, no, I'm if, asking if you, they this get, year. If they get Simmons, yes. No, you said Katie and Kyrie alone can beat anybody with this depth. No, no, I told you. I said last season. You're they talking about last almost, year? That's, no, no, that's the same no, team. No, but though. he's asking what's, this hold year. Hold he's just what, asking this year. On, what's the difference this year. between this year's net, this year Nets roster and last year's Nets roster? Who did this, they lose? But it's not Who the same roster, though. They're, they're not playing Who the did same. They lose? They're not playing Who the did same, they lose though. that's so important that they they're didn't not, have last they're year? They're not playing the same. Joe Harris has been playing. Katie's been more injury prone Okay, we know, but we're talking about giving Harris a We're talking about Griffin's game has dropped Blake Griffin has been the same. Blake Griffin last year wasn't this crazy player either. He was definitely a good piece for them. He was serviceable. He was a good definitely serviceable he's not been serviceable this year their only real loss was jeff green that's it he's replaceable kyrie's a part-timer now you just mentioned he could they, they, if he could play full-time if they pay a fine we're yep. assuming though no, 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 they'll do okay it. but we're assume. assuming we're there we're gonna see a healthy nets team that's what this is all of assumption it's true it's true okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. So in saying that, I'm just saying you said Katie and Kyrie alone. That's why I guess because last season in the playoffs they took the NBA champion Milwaukee Bucks. They were up 2-0 against them with Katie okay. and Kyrie. So this year you I, believe I am, they can win? I am of the belief that if Kyrie doesn't injure his ankle in that series, the Nets beat them. So and this year, I'm them. gonna ask one more time because you keep talking about last year. This year, I've been said K- this year. Yes, this they year, can Katie win. And Kyrie, yes. No, with just Katie any. and Kyrie, he's saying if they at like. Not just if they this, add Simmons, no, no, yes, no, of but course. That's not his question. But then, what's the question? He's, because all he's saying is, uh, yeah, bro, it's a just duo Katie, of yes. Katie and that's what you okay, said. A duo of said. a duo of Katie and Kyrie, surrounded by the proper depth, can win a championship. The depth they have currently, could they win a championship? You keep saying, you keep changing my question. Exactly, this is the yeah. reason why I'm not answering it directly is because it's a question that really is like, okay, if they don't have the depth, then they have Harden. But you if just, they do but, have the depth, that means Harden's gone and they got just, Simmons but, and other, another but, but player. But listen, the, only reason, I'm, the only reason I'm asking you the question is because you said, listen, KD and Kyrie can beat anybody alone. That's why I asked the question. So with this depth, KD and Kyrie, you think they can beat any team? That's why I asked the question because that's what you said. I understand. So that's why I was asking the question. So do you think those two can beat I any team? I know what you're that's saying, why I was asking. but we're under the assumption that if Harden gets no, traded, I do, yeah, but that's why I asked you the question. Why don't you just live in the scenario that he's creating? Just live in the scenario. Because the scenario is without James Harden and without well, I didn't create it. He said it. No, no, no. I understand. No, because you took it wrong. Of course, it's too like that's like saying, okay, with that's Kawhi and PG, can the Clippers win a championship? Mm-hmm. 
that's that's what you're asking me with Kyrie and KD. No, it's literally you literally said KD and Kyrie alone can beat any team in the league. Yes, so you, the you were, duo you, because the that, that, you you surround them with the proper depth. Yes, you can beat any I, team. That's why I, asked. I just said yes yeah, to that. No, but now but you keep but, adding proper. I, so yeah, I said, never mind, I, because yeah. the never mind, because never the, mind, the mind, there's mind. no scenario because the scenario you're naming is unrealistic it's and what won't you happen. Said, though, bro. No, because they are going to get depth for Harden or keep Harden. Yes. So your question is an unrealistic question. That why can't you just live in that scenario? Scenario. Because it's not realistic. All and right, it, but all you just have to do is my, yes or no. That and was my, it. And my answer was based on the I depth they get yeah, for Harden. I get it, That's bro, what it was. I, I get it. Yeah, with, it was surrounded with the yes proper no. depth, Kyrie and Katie can win a championship. Absolutely. Uh, it's the same thing with AD and LeBron. Yeah, AD and LeBron. Can, do I trust AD and LeBron to win a championship? Surrounded by the proper depth, absolutely. See, but that's the difference between you and I. Me, I would say with LeBron and AD. They could win a championship. I would say it with the depth they have now. AD and LeBron, they're healthy. Yes, I would like, say yes. It's like, it's like when but you try to the question when you I'm try to you. mix the word, mix the words like alone, alone. Like oh, you're telling the me word. You, they you, have you no play. Like you, come on, bro. bro, bro, come on, bro. You said with the proper depth, you could say that with any damn duo in the damn league. Like with the can. proper depth, but they can, can win, bro. Come on, like you that's why I actually that's not what you said. Like what the fuck? That's not what you said. That's why I was saying that, bro. Because you kept saying you wasn't saying what you said. That's why I kept asking you that question. But you keep saying all other extra. That's why I'm saying like you like what are you talking about? Bro, I, I'm, I'm basically repeating what you said, and I asked you a question. All the extra you was doing, you didn't have to do. All you had to do was just say yes or no, because I, I literally repeated what you said eight times, bro. That's why I kept saying it. But you keep yelling and you keep getting upset. I asked you, I literally repeated what you said, bro. That's all I was saying. Like that's why he's he's understanding what I'm saying. That's all I was saying, bro. You don't have to keep doing all that. Like, come on, all you had to do is live in the fantasy. Yeah, like uh, we come on. This is a show we do that all because the time. But you now know you're what not, I meant, though. You know no, what I, I meant. That's we why all you know what I meant. We all knew you what you meant. We all knew you know what I meant. We all knew you meant. We do that all the time, and that's that was confusion. Fact. Like so, uh, so uh, can you answer the question now? Can you just do no us that point. favor? I don't want the question. Answered. Yes, it, they yes. could do it. Yes, with this death. Yes. Okay. All right. There we go. Nice. I'm glad we got an answer. I mean, you guys pretty much said everything I had to say. To be honest with you. So, I mean, I side with Joel. I pretty much side with Joel. I agree. I agree. What, out of what you guys all said, I agree more with Joel. Yeah, because yo, yeah. God I mean, there's damn. nothing left for me to say. <laughs> we just got Joel stuck made on some one, great points, though. Joel we just got stuck points. on one entire point oh. off of something that was on an unrealistic scenario, bro. I, I, it was just yeah. a scenario. All you have to do is just answer yes or no. Because obviously, because yeah, better, I know. Though. Because I know what, what the mean. hell? What the hell? Because what the hell is the difference between saying they this duo can win with the proper depth uh -huh. versus they can win alone? He just, it's the it same a, fucking question. It, it I it's guess, just worded yeah, differently. No. So I answered your question. You just wanted me to answer that specific yeah, scenario. That is what he with wanted. With that alone versus depth. It's yeah. the same damn question, bro. It's uh, just worded differently. It wasn't going. alone. That wasn't it. He asked with this current depth. He's not getting it, bro. Yeah, let it go. I know. Let it go. That's let why. It it's, it's that's over. why. It's over. Let it go. Just let it go. Well, this let current go. depth is James Harden is, is added on the team then. Like, of just course. let it go. It's over. It's over. Just let it go. Yeah, we could go to the next topic. Let it go, bro. Okay, the last topic of the show, Julius Randle, right now, there's drama in New York. He might not be a Nick. And That's how crazy. much sense does a Julius Randle for De'Aaron Fox swap make for the Kings and the Knicks? Do you think the Knicks should trade Julius Randle? There, there was, he's at, somebody, Mark Berman, told him about this report, and he said, these rumors are just gossip. I loved, they have, loved that interview. Which I one? loved it. Between this reporter and Julius Mark Berman Randall. and Julius Randle. I yeah. loved it. Why'd you love it? Because Julius Randle basically just scoffed in his face. It's like you're just coming up with stuff that's nonsense. Mm. And you know, it, Julius Randle hasn't been playing great. And I've been very critical of him. Very. Especially over these last couple of weeks. Last two games, he started to to, to put in the right direction. Hasn't completely turned into to Knicks wins. But you know what? He's, he's, from what I'm seeing in this video and just the last couple of games alone, his attitude towards... The game right now is starting to shift, and he's starting to understand. You know what? I'm riding with my my squad. I trust my squad. I'm going to trust my abilities, whether I play good or not. It's getting to the point where he's on a it is what it is attitude. Those are dangerous. Those are dangerous types of ball players. And again, I've been critical of Randall. I don't think that he's he's a quarter of what he was last season. But I can respect a, an answer like that. You're, a reporter's coming to you trying to clearly get a reaction. And sure, he got a reaction out of him. But it was the right reaction mm. where it's a BS, a BS article, a BS statement that was just made up out of thin air. And Julius basically just said, you just want to start something within our organization that's unnecessary. I loved it. Totally. Some has speculated that 
he won't get traded because the Knicks, the Knicks PR put this video out. It was great. The Knicks YouTube channel put this yeah, video out. It was awesome. Which means that he might not get traded, which is honestly making me sick to my stomach. Because I want to see De'Aaron Fox in New York. I get it. I get it. It's De'Aaron Fox, and you guys need a, a true point guard. Is Fox a true point guard? He's not a true point guard, but he fits their timeline. I think they're going to... Trend towards you the know, younger side now because he know isn't they a true get the point guard, but he's he's definitely the he, Knicks. He has a higher need, ceiling than Julius Randle. The Knicks need a point guard, and that's no denying that. But Fox is also another guy who's been struggling this year, just like Randle. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, it like, uh, like, and I, he started to cook up. Though. Yeah, I like, and you know, what? I like Fox in a new environment. You know, I think New York would be a good spot for him. They need a point guard. You know, they need somebody who could defend. He seems he, dejected. Yeah, he, and he seems like he just needs a new environment. Mm-hmm. I think, like, you know, he offers defense. He's a good playmaker. His jump shot is getting better. You know, it's not there, but it's getting better. You know, he's a, he's really fast. And I feel like he can play under Tom Thibodeau. But I think a swap, like Julius Randle, I think in Sacramento would be cool. They need a power forward. You know, somebody, no you know, him, Barnes, Tyrese can now be the point guard, a real point guard. So I think that would be good for him too. Davion has been cooking real, since he's been in the yeah, starting he's, rotation. He's, he's Come on, bro. What, bro? I'm being I'm serious. Like, like, he's not a point guard, though. He's no, I'm more, saying in the know? starting rotation. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's, he's been good. But I Since just, he's like, been in the starting rotation, I like, he's like averaging Halle over 15. Burton, I feel like we'll open up Randall's game a lot more because of the fact that he's such a, a really good floor general. So I think, like, if this, it, you, like you said, it might not happen. It might not be true. But if this is on the table, I don't see why the Knicks say no. Or they don't like, entertain it. Yeah, like, this is something that should really be, like, they should make this move. This Fox is, if I'm not mistaken, younger than Randall, or he's, like, he's still he young. He's younger than him. So that's something that, like, that's something you look. Listen, R.J. Barrett, Evan Fournier, he's under contract. Mitch, if he comes back, these are guys that can really work around De'Aaron Fox. He's not a bad playmaker. He's a good playmaker. He's a solid floor general. So this is somebody who can really open up their games. And this is another defender that you're bringing in. He's motivated. He wants to play in a new environment. New York. He's played in Kentucky. Like he said, he's never lost until he got to the Kings. Playing in Kentucky, he understands that winning mentality. Going to New York, now he can kind of bring that chip on his shoulder. Mm-hmm. And now you got a bunch of young guys with chips on their shoulder. And that want to be there. And like, Obi Toppin gets a little bit more. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, also. I think that's a good place. Like, you know what I'm saying? I think that's a good place. But that's just me. I would, if I'm the Knicks, I'm looking at that like, that's a move I got to make. You know, but in, like, there's other teams too. You know, Pelicans are looking at Fox too. So, like, Fox is a sought out type of point guard. But I think the Knicks should pounce on that immediately. The Knicks have to face the realization that this isn't the year we're probably going to make the playoffs, which means we have to go all in on having a young core that can compete for years to come and getting one of these top picks. We're going to get a top pick. Hopefully the lottery gives us some luck this time around. Nope. I like Fox, Grimes, RJ, OB, Mitch. I like that young core. I think we can deal Fournier and Alec Burks. Kemba has been on the table as well that we might get a second round pick from, which is honestly disgusting (laughs) because he's a player that had much more. We had much more expectations for him than that. He's gone scoreless in his last two contests. I feel like this is perfect for both teams. The Kings have an abundance of guards on their roster already. Now, if you trade Fox, you can have Halliburton, Heald, Barnes, Randall, Rashawn Holmes starting. That's That fits their team better than with Fox and then having to have Heald come off the bench when he's clearly more of a starter and fits that role more. And the Knicks... Like you said, it opens up minutes for Obi, And I think right now, Julius Randle, I don't know what he's going through personally, but he's not playing to his level. I think New York has grown tired of him. Julius Randle called out the fans. Right now, it's just not a good scenario for either side, for the Knicks fans or for Julius Randle. Randle needs a new start where fans can start to appreciate his game a little bit more. And in Sacramento, that isn't what New York is in terms of the criticism and backlash you face on a nightly basis, he can thrive in a scenario like that. Yeah, I'm with you. What do you think, JC? Yeah, I mean, I I think he fits their, the Knicks timeline as well. I mean, they need a point guard. I mean, obviously, the Cole Campbell Walker situation hasn't really worked out. And, you know, obviously, the Evan Fournier. I mean, the Knicks constructed this team because they were going off the momentum of last year that they thought that they could make a deeper playoff push with this team, obviously. It really hasn't worked out. Julius Randle's regressed. He's looking like Julius Randle from the first year he was there, putting up pretty much similar numbers on on the same um, field goal splits. And then as far as De'Aaron Fox, I mean, I was watching the Nets and the Kings game the other day, and I've been watching uh, a lot of, you know, I watched, I follow this YouTube channel called NF that shows you full 
highlights of the games, like every shot and everything. That's cool. And, uh, you know, Tyrese definitely looks like an above and beyond better playmaker than De'Aaron Fox. And, you know, I Maxie? saw it. No, uh, oh, Halle Burton. Halle Burton, yeah. Um, I saw it against the Nets. I think he had, he didn't shoot too well, but he had like about 13, 14 assists. He was running that team well. And I think Julius Randle fits their timeline as well. You know, you get Tyrese and you can bring Buddy off the bench. You got Rashawn Holmes, who's a solid center. You got Julius Randle, Harrison Barnes. I mean, that's a pretty solid team. I think that's a team that could fight for the play-in if everything goes right. And, um, you know, for the Knicks, I mean, I, I think they're, it's smarter for them to trend towards going building through the draft because that team that they have this year – or the one that they had last year peaked. And, you know, obviously at the end of the day, you know, sometimes a lot of these options and, and pieces aren't going to work work out just like Kemba Walker. I mean, he hasn't looked the same. Derrick Rose has been injured. So, I they mean, miss him. and then, and then as, far as, as far as Julius Randle, I think that the relationship between the franchise, the fans, and him, I think it's just, I think his meltdowns and him telling the fans to be quiet and the fans just, you know, jumping all over him and his lack of play and his poor play this year. I think it's a better situation for both players. I think De'Aaron Fox goes to New York Knicks. I don't know if he gets the keys because I don't know if he'd be the best player. I think it would be between R.J. Barrett and him, maybe. RJ is, I think Fox is better right now. R.J. is okay. tweaking right yeah. now. Yeah, he's playing really well right 17 now. 17 in but the first quarter. As far as like your backcourt, I mean, you have a young backcourt because Fox is still young, so he fits their timeline more. And then Julius Randle, he's about, what, 27, 28 years old? Uh, 26. 26? Oh, pardon me. Julius? No, he's getting up there. I think he's 20. I wouldn't say 28. I want to say 27. I don't really know how old he is, to be honest. 26. I, I thought it was 27, 28. 20, oh, never mind. Uh, 26? He's 27. 27. 27? Yeah. So, all right. When's so his birthday? November. November 29th. Just yeah, he turned. So, yeah, he's 27. So, I, I feel like he fits he, I feel like he fits Sacramento's uh, timeline more. And I think his style of play... I think I think we could see a resurgence from Julius Randle in a different uh, in a different role in a different environment, and I think the same with De'Aaron Fox. He can showcase his talents and help the Knicks, you know, obviously build something going for the future. And I think if you have a backcourt of RJ and De'Aaron Fox, that's the right, you know, that's not a bad backcourt. Then you have to just worry about the frontcourt players. So I think it would benefit both players, and I, I hope the Knicks pull the trigger on on a deal like this. I think it would help both teams out. The trade deadline is the 10th, which means that we won't wait long for what actually happens during this deadline. Excited. We'll definitely recap it next week on our newest basketball episode, who gets traded, who should have got traded, and all that other stuff. This is going to do it for episode 152 of the Pick Aside podcast. You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Pick Aside Podcast, on Twitter at Pick Aside Pod. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.